CB AM. With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. It's half past seven. You're very welcome along to Friday's OTB AM. It's Owen and Ashling with you right the way through until 10 o'clock this morning. And we've got a packed show coming your way over the next couple of hours. We're going to have Mark Lawrence in with us before eight o'clock to look ahead to another busy weekend of Premier League action. We'll be joined in studio by Jenny Claffey to have a technical look at the career of Serena Williams. And then beyond that, the crappy quiz is back. We'll be hearing from the same Pats camp after last night's defeat to CSK Sophia. And then there's going to be plenty of reaction to what has been another very busy 24 hours in the managerial merry-go-round that is the inter-county GEA off-season. You can tweet us at Off The Ball. You can drop a comment on the YouTube stream if that's where you're watching. Ashling O'Reilly, how are you getting on? Good now, Owen. How are you? Very well. And Colin Buick is with us in studio as well. How are you, Colin? Owen and Ashling, happy Friday, as Ooh. the kids say. When did that come in? Happy Friday. I'm not a fan. The kids say. What are you saying? Well, what age are we? When did happy Friday come in? What do you mean, Mothman did Happy Friday? People start saying Happy Friday now. It's a big thing. If you go into the kitchen there, every, every second person saying Happy Friday, as opposed to every other day of the week. But I feel like that only became a thing in the last five years or so. And what, what about it irks you so much? <laughs> well, Jojo, Jojo agrees with me. Um, it's, well, it's disingenuous. Is it disingenuous? Are you not happy on this Friday? Aren't you? It's Friday, isn't that great? But Happy Friday. It might not be a Happy Friday for you. Is, is it a Happy Friday for you? Uh, yeah, it is, yeah. Do you well, not approach, well, nice. if you see Colin on the streets of Dublin today, anybody or wherever you may be I know you. I know you agree with me. Uh, just what a way to, to start don't, the show. Don't say anything <laughs> about uh, <laughs> it being a Friday to, to Colin. He is uh, miserable at the best of times, but uh, today is a, a very, mean, very bad day. To- that's totally untrue. Um, <laughs> is it a happy Friday for Waterford Hurling fans this morning? Like, is is this the, the, the comeback that everybody in Waterford wants? Is this the, the sort of, you know, uh, are, we, are we using the mantra, never go back? Or are we saying, up to date, this is it, back to the glory days and maybe back to the, to the summit of the mountain that they've been trying to get to for decades and decades at this point? Uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much of a happy Friday is it for Waterford, Ashling? I was trying to gauge it on social media last night just when I heard it announced. And it seems pretty positive. I think overall, I'd say it's at the moment, it's maybe a seven or eight out of ten, I would say. There's definitely hesitation there as well um, to bring someone back again, but also to bring someone back that isn't their own for a second second go at it um, is pretty massive. And I think with Waterford, like they won the league last year in our quick picks. You know, I backed them, I think, in the first round. They looked good and then they just fell completely flat in the championship and they just lack that bit of passion and energy mm. that you would normally see with, with Waterford so one thing that Davy Fitz has is passion and energy and they need to sort of reignite that and I think if that's one thing that he can do you know to, to bring that bit of passion back into Hurling there because they have brilliant players all around the pitch they just don't seem to work as a whole as well as they could I feel um, I've talked to a few uh, of the lads last year and that was something that one or two of them said to me sort of off the mic that it feels like they fully don't click as a whole mm. that sometimes when they're playing with club and stuff it's a little bit different so uh, yeah some of these big players that uh, are tearing it up for their clubs to be able to yeah. do it for Waterford it's, it's changed so rapidly I mean, I remember reading all the previews ahead of Munster starting and everybody was like Waterford are so dangerous mm-hmm. I remember everyone wrote off Clare no, like Clare aren't going to be in contention at all. And then they, the narrow victory over Tip in the first match, I think it was by four points, and they weren't convincing at all. And that was a bit of a worry. I would like have fairly strong water for connections, and like it was a worry in the family there about like that wasn't convincing. It just went completely downhill from there, like to an alarming degree. And one thing about Davy, he brings passion and all that, but he actually had a tremendous record at Waterford in his tenth there. Do you know like? Since an 8 all iron final, losing to an era-defining Kilkenny side is no shame. I know it's 23 points, but still. And to get to the semi-final in all four seasons, Munster title in 2010 against Cork. So, like, CV-wise, as usual with Davy and our own Ronan Mullen was saying it last night, Ronan was saying, like, you know, they, it's the cult of Davy gets in the way of his CV, which is actually very impressive. Yeah. The, que- mm-hmm. the question I would have is, what was the, the peak of that Waterford team? 
like I'm not sure what people at home think I would uh, often have had 2007 as the peak of the Waterford team that it was actually pre Davy, and I think that's as much maybe down to maybe the age profile of some of the players that I thought the 2008 All-Ireland final where they get creamed by Kilkenny I don't think they would have won an All-Ireland anyway before that but I think not getting to the, the All-Ireland the year previous was, was the one that really stung losing that, that semi-final I think they were the team that maybe could have got Kilkenny early on in their run so I kind of have to peek at that Waterford team there before Davy takes over at the same time when you look at the, the other side of the coin like the last time Waterford have won a Munster Championship Davy Fitzgerald was their manager like it's crazy to think that like I, I had somewhere in my head that they've got one maybe even two Munster Championships since then but they've still been chasing it since Davy was manager so you can see why they go back in for this because the GEA has proven over the last few years that going back in for a manager who you are familiar with isn't a bad idea whatsoever look at the All-Ireland winning football manager at Kerry at the moment I, I think when you look at Liam Sheedy going back in with Tip that seemed to work out pretty well for them in 2019 and even bits and pieces that didn't work out like I think what, what the, the, the most the best example you can give on a football level for what the current Waterford malaise is, is is Mayo and they went back for James Horan uh, second time lucky was what they were hoping and they did come pretty close I know they didn't get over the All-Ireland but it wasn't like it fell flat in its face when the manager came back in for a second time so I think this is a good appointment it's really interesting though that they've gone for a, a two year term for, for an option with a third yeah. it's pretty standard practice to be fair in, in yeah. GEA but it, that just kind of speaks to the we know that there's going to be two years here where Davy can work his magic and we'll see about the third. Maybe they've been listening to James Scatlin off the ball a bit. <laughs> <laughs> but the return I, I had anticipated was possibly Derek McGrath. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, That'll probably happen at speak, some stage. speaking of, you know, successful returns, I mean, it was under McGrath that they came so close in 2017. That was three points defeat to Galway in that final. I was at that match. And Galway were definitely the better side. They definitely deserved to win the All Ireland that year. But there was a. There was a, and a swing of the hurl from Mara Shanahan, I think, in the last book of the game. Like, and if you connected with that, it was probably a goal. You know, and that was a level game. It was probably undeserved that was going to be the case, but they came really close then and I was kind of anticipating a McGrath return. And as you say, yeah, he could be next in line, but I didn't see Davy coming. No. But so when he left, the, when he left the, like fairly abruptly in the Cork set up the well, weekend, yeah. you know, we were talking about that beforehand. It was a surprise how abrupt it was and something was coming. Didn't expect it to be this so soon. He said he was trying out stuff uh, with uh, the Cork Mokey team this year. I hadn't, like when you look at the quotes now, I think they printed them in the Examiner today in John Fogarty's piece. And now when you look at it in hindsight, it's like, what was he trying out that we're going to see for Waterford next season? Um, yeah, well, they used a, a sweeper. I don't know if it was tactically he was trying things out. Uh, they definitely used a sweeper that was a little bit different to Cork Mokey that I would have seen in previous years. Um, but speaking to any of the players, like it was very evident what he brought to the table like they they straight away would light up and say like you know it's a person that comes first with Davy, and then it's the hurling and I think I was going back to Waterford I think that's what they need and is that the whole path like in the next two years to have this bit of passion back in there get them playing good hurling like what would be successful in these two years for, for mm. Davy to achieve Beating Limerick, I think they, they, they will be thinking. <laughs> That's they, the All well, Ireland. Not, it possibly is not, possibly. not Limerick off the perch. But when you when you put it like that, I mean, when, when it's the people in the dressing room, the age of this team now are the sort of players who were kids going to matches in the, the John Milan era and the, the, yeah. the Dan Shanahan era, seeing them get over the line in, in 2010, winning a Munster title, whatever, 2007, 2008, coming coming close enough to getting to an All-Ireland final and then maybe not making it when they get to the All-Ireland final. But, but those were glory days, relatively speaking, yeah. for Waterford. These players who are currently wearing the white of Waterford were, I presume, hurling fanatics back then. And Davy Fitz, to a lot of them, I suspect, was something of a hero maybe even maybe that's too strong a word but definitely somebody who was revered by a lot of those players and now they're being managed by him and I think that actually has an that's impact that's exciting that's, uh, that's going to be so much energy you know coming mm. back it's fresh all of that really plays a part doesn't it on a, on a panel once you get back in there they're all going to be fighting for places all that creeps into a team yeah and also all of them now are going to be seriously aware that the spotlight is going to be on them like mega time way more than it was in the last few years and they're probably all acknowledging that as they wake up this morning that like there's going to be a whole lot more interest than us there already was a massive amount but there's going to be more now I think in terms of success you're looking at a monster title aren't you anything that's not the league I think so yeah you know to start with like maybe even year two if they get year one monster final and then semi-final but like what if we got to you know a couple of all Ireland finals recently like they should have higher standards than that but I think they need to win something that's not the league, basically, in its first two years. And if he does that, that can be deemed as somewhat a success, depending on what happens after Munster. Yeah, 
it's hard though because as you just said beating Limerick means winning the All-Ireland winning Munster is like you've yeah. beaten the best team of the generation and but it's easier the, to do it then than later it's, yeah. it's true it's true and uh, Limerick definitely looked more vulnerable I would say in the, the Munster yeah. Championship this year and, and last year to be fair so maybe that is it maybe that's how you, you beat Limerick is in the Munster Championship but the, the, the ceiling of success it's, it's going to be interesting to see where they put that themselves I'm sure privately they'll be saying it's Liam McCarthy or, or failure and I don't think David Fitz would be going in there mm. for any other reason it'll be really interesting to see what the, the backroom team uh, looks like I mean uh, Sorsha Bulfin looks like he's going for the, the Mead job so yeah. um, his trusty lieutenant probably won't be involved next season it's been mentioned in the examiner as well this morning that he's worked with Don Logue in the past uh, Brendan Bugler in the past and some suggestion that maybe Michael Brick Walsh or Noel Connors could be uh, answering a phone call from Davy Fitz as well over uh, the next few weeks so that's yet to be confirmed they haven't confirmed yet or, or haven't revealed yet who's going to be on the backroom team and it has been a pretty wild as I say 12 to 24 hours on the managerial front reports as well this morning that Stephen Rochford is now being linked with Ross Common so that's another fascinating element to, to his off season he, he's said to be on the Kevin McStay ticket to go to Mayo as well and then you've got the Offaly story we will have Willow Callaghan with us later on to get a bit more depth to this thing but Liam Sheedy and Eamon O'Shea have been linked with uh, the Offaly hurling job uh, I should say Eamon O'Shea and Liam Sheedy Eamon O'Shea being linked with the, the managerial role uh, and then Liam Kearns set to take over as the footballing manager and then the other bit of news uh, overnight is that Pat Flanagan looks like he's going to take over as Longford manager with Ger Brennan coming on board as his coach so there is a lot happening again a lot of those things yet to be confirmed but reports across the newspapers this morning that that's what's going to happen we will have the quick picks and uh, as I say Willow Callaghan joining us for that later on and our revelation of who actually won the quick picks this year because I don't know who is on top is it Tommy is it Ashley oh, is it Will who cares confusing. nobody yeah. cares about that uh, <laughs> oh, uh, I care. everyone, everyone cares everyone cares there are three people in this world know the results as we speak I'm delighted to be one of those three right. there are two other people Emma and Cameron of Team OTB. Do we have a gold envelope? Better than that. It's going to reveal on screen. It's going to shock you all. There's going to be probably like the biggest known on radio, there'll be stunned silence. Someone's oh going to no, have to, someone's going like to, have to, to fill the air. This. Someone's going to have to Did fill Owen the win? air. Did Owen win? The calculations were wrong all along. Last night, and I gave him a little hint about a possible result. I think Will picked up on it. I'm not sure, but we'll see. Well, very exciting times indeed. You don't want to miss that. That's coming up in the eight to nine hour. Mm-hmm. It is Friday morning. It, happy Friday to you happy both. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a theme here on uh, it's a theme here on Fridays OTBAM that we uh, we talk about Arsenal and uh, the Amazon documentary that is uh, currently airing. Uh, it comes out on Thursday, so naturally this is our first time to react to it. Another three episodes dropped yesterday on the All or Nothing documentary, and and there was a bit of a mixed reaction. I think last week, uh, first of all, to, to Mikel Arteta and whether or not he's David Brent or Pep Guardiola, and also just a bit of a differing opinion on whether or not the documentary is any good. Whether it's a bit of a puff piece for. Arsenal and that may still be the case but I don't think you can argue that this week's helping isn't very dramatic because we've got the Pierre Emerick Aubameyang saga being laid bare in the documentary and it's brilliant television if you haven't checked it out just yet the slow build over episodes four and five which uh, have been part of the three episodes that have been dropped this week is like Game of Thrones it's uh, it's so much intrigue (laughs) so tense even though you know what's going to happen it's uh, brilliantly made. Um, you've been catching up on a bit of it, Ashling? Yeah, I got one last night um, in. So, yeah, I'm intrigued to see a little bit more about uh, Aubameyang. That was fascinating, seeing exactly what went on. Obviously, we, we all heard it when it happened, but you don't really get to see the insight behind it and um, how they heard when, when he left first um, and they just hear from Twitter, you know, like where he is, uh, is, is madness. You just, you just think there's so much more to these things and they definitely have a clue, but no, he went off behind their back. Yeah, so th- this is the deadline day this year, uh, January 2022, and uh, Aubameyang hasn't been training with the team for quite some time. He's gone to the African Cup of Nations. He's come back. He continues to train on his own. Mikel Arteta is not for budging. He's not going to allow him back into the squad, and he's going to continue to train on his own. Arsenal say that they want to terminate his contract, but they need somebody to basically give him a two-year deal. Uh, a loan deal will not be good enough. Barcelona are picking up the phone, and they're like, we will offer you a loan proposition for the player. That doesn't suit Arsenal. And then... Team Aubameyang screw things up by allowing uh, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang to get on a plane to Barcelona and naturally it is spotted on social media. He is spotted at Barcelona airport and Arsenal are like, hold on a minute, 
we didn't give you permission to go to Barcelona. You're still our player. You're still contracted to us. And there is this brilliant scene where Edu is on the phone to one of Aubameyang's representatives being like, what the hell is going on here? And the representatives are stuttering on the phone and they're like, oh, I mean, his, uh, his dad lives in Barcelona. And then it was like, <laughs> yes, of course, we are living in this Disney world. And it was like, boom, one up on you. And then himself and Richard Garlick are like, now we wait. Oh, and, I haven't seen this and bit. And Barcelona blinked first. 11.59, papers in, Aubameyang is off the books. I mean, this all speaks to quite a big Arsenal puff piece and they come out of it looking very well, but uh, it's dramatic if nothing else, Colin. Oh, yeah. That's that's a beautiful piece of television because uh, it's all about Richard Garlick and Edu for me in these two of the three episodes that you and I have seen so far. And Edu, like, what a dreamboat. Like, that guy, he's just, yeah. he can't do anything wrong in my eyes. That, he's, I want to work for Edu. There's <laughs> something about him, like, there's a magnetism to him. And Richard Garlick is kind of the workhorse of the relationship, like, and kind of, like, he's the, you know, Edu's like the brains and brawn. So anyway, they come in and they're like... Uh, it's, I think it's the media officers like uh, Aubameyang's in uh, Barcelona kind of mumbles it when he comes into the room and Edu's like sorry <laughs> yeah he's uh, like do you do know like, that uh... yeah, yeah and he's like oh he, he's there and then Edu now they may have edited this that might have been take two but Edu is so relaxed that he's just like uh, oh yeah yeah tell me again yeah and then he shows him Twitter and, but it's amazing to me that like a club as elite as Arsenal this is how they find out things. Like everybody else is like, oh, show me there on Twitter. Is that, is that a, I was like, oh, wow, he's in, he's in Barcelona. Oh, okay, okay, that's fine. Mm. Yeah, that's fine. And I thought they'd go mental, but I suppose they're so aware that the cameras are there that they don't. But I love that part of it. Um, maybe, you'd be, maybe Timo Aubameyang knew exactly what they were doing by oh, making did, sure did, he, did, he did. walked into a very public place and they kind of forced oh, absolutely. Both, both clubs. Yeah. They 100%, yeah, they 100% knew. But, uh, I mean, Mikel Arteta, for me, is just coming across better and better with each passing episode. And at one point, I was like, halfway through episode five, I was thinking, this guy can do no wrong in my eyes. Every decision he's making here, I agree with. And he's coming across really well. And he comes up with a bit of innovation every time he talks in front of the crowd. I know last week we were laughing at the you'll never walk alone <laughs> idea of playing it during training and they go on to lose 4 0. That was bad. But then his other moments were just rubbing the hands thing before Leicester City away, you know, and then getting them all to hold hands. Now, if they had lost that game, you know, we'd be, we'd be talking about it now. And then afterwards, the players are kind of mocking him for doing that, asking for two days off, which he initially gives thumbs down. And all the players are like, oh, and he gives the thumbs up. And it's like, yes, Arteta, this guy's working the crowd so well for a young manager. Yeah. It's really good. Do you know, there's lo- and there's loads, of, there's loads of little nuggets you're getting from it. Like one thing, away dressing rooms in Premier League are very basic. Mm. We're getting that. Leicester City, Not Liverpool. Forest, it's very claustrophobic. Yeah. Oh my God, Nottingham Forest is horrible. Uh, everything. On, on Arteta, the, like the, what we've seen this week now is that uh, we were seeing Arteta the hard ass come out and there's no more Mr. Nice Guy. There's, there's less whiteboard action this week except for like one where he draws a diagram of a river and he talks about the question is it all about the journey or is it all about the destination and I think Lacazette says destination and I don't think that's what no I don't think that was the right answer was it (laughs) and and what what we have is um, just him asserting his dominance now because of the I think because of the Aubameyang thing that's given him the confidence as a manager to be like this is my dressing room now and they go on a warm weather training camp to Dubai in the January transfer window last year and it doesn't look like a fun experience for for any of them so yeah Arteta comes out of this looking really good I'm always conscious of that though this is uh, an Arsenal documentary where they have given Amazon uh, open doors so I'm sure a lot of Arsenal people come out of it looking really well and that's possibly their own objective as well one of the other things that kind of just stuck out to me was just seeing uh, Barry Solon and uh, hearing the Mayo accents in conversation with Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang when he came back from the the African Cup of Nations rough few weeks is uh, what Barry Solon I think says (laughs) to him and asks him about his mother um, and Aubameyang pretty well looked after uh, by the Arsenal staff when he was training on his own so uh, it wasn't a, a complete alienation of him over those few weeks so worth, worth chatting around or worth, um, worth checking that out if, if you're an Amazon subscriber or, or can get your hands on that because it is pretty good and it is the best part of it now the, uh, the, the Aubameyang situation Can I just say one thing watching this series and watching the Spurs one because myself Will and Endercal formerly of this parish we reviewed the Spurs all or nothing and is it just the greatest content to miss of the 21st century is the fact that Manchester United haven't done an all or nothing? Because can you imagine the behind the scenes at United? Not yet. They, why would they do it to themselves? Well, I mean, why would they do a lot of things to themselves? Could be a question you could ask of many of their decisions over the past I know, yeah, years. and so, exactly. So why can't that be documented for us? I mean, can you imagine? No because chance Arsenal... they want that documented. It's literally their worst time ever. Yeah. But Arsenal has run quite well. <laughs> Up there. You know? Like um, the possibility as, as it transpires possibility of the Amazon cash uh, you know the, the global brands that is Manchester United being furthered 
I mean, that's that's as important. And as if they can flip it and it comes out in a brilliant story in the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Like, I mean, and, and it tends to kind of coincide with a new manager as well, which shows they're going into Spurs and Arteta yeah. at Arsenal. I, like, I mean, the, the the soap opera is already pretty good without getting a, an inside look into to Old Trafford anyway. So, uh, maybe next year. Maybe well, next year. What's your rating of um, Arteta's ballocking levels? Do you think he does it well? Nine. It's really oh. good. Yeah. It's way better than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Very good. Very, very, very impressive. Yeah. Would you be afraid of him? Oh yeah, absolutely. Just there, yeah. I mean, that's what I, that's why I'm so impressed by this guy. He's low I, I, He's yeah. less intense than I thought You're he was. Being swept be. away by this thing, though, Colin. You do like <laughs> gotta look at this with the colder eyes. I think. No, I'm excited. Excited, yeah. Yeah. I look. I, I can give you the list of flaws too, but I'm just. I'm all about it. I think people should watch it. I'd like more and more people to watch it. I think this is kind of passing a few people by. So I'd like people to watch it. There yeah. was one point in the the last episode, um, or sorry, in the the fourth one, where the players are looking at each other when he's he's losing it in the dressing room and they're looking at each other with fear in their eyes like looking around going wow and that was the first time I'd really seen him like let loose yeah. um, but I think you need a bit of that you have to you have to have a bit of that you know to yeah. to own the dressing room yeah, yeah. for them to believe you can do all these like rubbing the hands doing all this but you need to have something to back it all up don't well you, you notice so, the difference when he misses the Manchester City game of Covid yeah. And then he has to do the team talk from Skype. And I'm, I'm like, what, I wonder what feed they set him up for that match. Because he's like, I'm watching the match on TV, I'm going to be with you every step of the way. Is he just watching this like the rest of us? No, he's not. Does he have his own special one? No, he's not. Because I saw over his shoulder, there is like a, a wide shot of the, this is very technical talk. There's a wide shot of the stadium yeah. over his shoulder, which wouldn't represent like the halftime analysis on, yeah. on BT. It would have been because that was a 12.30 game. Uh, it was just like a still shot of the overhead. So he had his own feed that wasn't BT by the looks of things. That's very, um, very niche. Well, very crowd inside baseball chat right here. And listen to his chat, and they were roused by it like. And they played very well in that Manchester City game. That was the game that everybody went on about for weeks afterwards, even though they lost. Yeah, for sure. Uh, just a couple of other things we want to touch on. We'll get to St. Pat's in just a moment, but uh, Ashley, we have you in studio, um, so we may as well get a, a quick Celtic heat check. Two games yeah. in, two, two wins games from in, two. Two wins. Yeah. How are they looking so far? Looking good, yeah. It's exciting. I think last year when Ange came in, we he was building. You know, he's bringing players in around the the sort of play that he plays, the system that he plays, quick football, and he didn't have a hell of a lot of time with them, especially in pre season. Now he's had a, a full pre season. He's had a, a lot of time with them, so I think it's this year we're really going to see the the fruits of them. And um, they re-signed Jada, Carter Vickers, which is two of their probably best players last year. Well, definitely up there, and yeah, that's been massive for them. And Jada has been absolutely tearing it up uh, this year he's just unbelievable to watch um, so yeah it's brilliant to see him fully signed and yeah I think probably that was probably the best business that he's done so far and he's just creating this team I think around that, the, the way they play that, that fast pace uh, football that they play one touch you know it's very quick and it's yeah it's seriously exciting to watch and Kyogo up front Tate in the middle all these players who just came in last year to really see them come into the game now into the play with the, with the players around them because it takes a little while to to work on you know the the teamwork that goes with the cohesion all of that so I think we're, we're really seeing it now they're starting to click um, so yeah I think it's exciting times and we've yeah Champions League as well to look forward to those Tuesday, Wednesday nights, that's going to be possibly the defining moments of the season. And um, it's exciting to have them back. And uh, Yeah, first time in five years. So, yeah, it's massive. And, yeah, hopefully by the end of, say, after December, we're still looking at European football. That would be the aim. But I think for this year, you know, it, it's to, to win all the trophies in Scotland. And then, yeah, to be still playing European football would be, be massive to have a good run. Comment in from Joe Mason says, will you calm down with the spoiler zone I'm planning to watch this evening? Sorry about that. It is too late. <laughs> if you're just joining us and uh, you don't want any spoilers on the real life documentary that is Arsenal All or Nothing, don't rewind this to listen to the last 10 minutes because we've just spoiled the whole thing. Still worth checking out. Right. It is uh, 7.53. You're with us here on OTBAM, which is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. We've got Mark Lawrence on standby. We'll get to him in just a moment. But as you can see, we've got Jenny Claffey and Quick Picks filling out the 8 o'clock hour. Our top 10 GA moments of the season brought to you by Ashling at 20 to 9. And then the crappy quiz is back at 5 past 9. We'll close you out tonight with Ed, Ed McGreal, who is explaining the... Mayo managerial situation there it's uh, very intriguing as it always is when there is an appointment to be made in Mayo right at 7.54 delighted to say good morning to Mark Lawrenson how are you Mark? I'm all right, apart from my Wi-Fi failing, but you'd think out your life's over, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Mad, isn't it? 
Uh, this weekend, Mark, uh, we look at the half four game on, on Sunday first up. It feels like a significant enough one because last season, or last weekend, I should say, it feels like the common uh, mood is that Tottenham are the big winners from the weekend. Just a brilliant performance. They've added so much depth to their squad. They've got one of the best managers in the league. Everything is looking rosy in the garden. But to go to Chelsea this weekend, it sort of feels like there's an immediate pressure on Spurs to do something on Sunday. Yeah, I mean, you could say they made a, a mini statement beating Southampton, who actually looked like they're going to lose the manager any day as well, but um, they came back from the 1-0 um, deficit. But I, th- I think this is just, first and foremost, why, why are these games so early in the season? You want another 10 games before these two play each other. But I mean, the thing we're talking about is, is, yes, uh, outstanding manager, yes, they made some very, very good signings. Let's just see if they gel and... Um, you know, a big thing for them would always be that if Kane gets injured and, and he does seem to get injured during some stage of the season, um, will Richarlison take over? You know, will he be good enough? Will he be, not, be good enough to win enough games? I certainly think they will finish third in the league or be vying for third. I don't, I don't see them vying for first or second. They're not that good yet. It, it does seem that they are better placed this season to maybe withstand an injury to Kane. Like, I'm not saying yeah. they have anybody like it, but it, do, it does seem they've just bulked up significantly in the attacking positions. Yeah. I mean, Richarlison's obviously a good signing, um, so he, he'll make a difference. Yeah, there's no doubt about it, but Tottenham can be, you know, they call it down here, they can be a bit spursy, and a bit spursy is when you go away to Burnley and you get beat 1-0 and you don't even look like a team. Now, that's happened probably too often in the last few years. Now, I would imagine with the players that Conti signed, that will not happen. It'll be something that he's identified and that will make all the difference. But let, let's just wait and see. They've, they made a good start, as I say, it was Southampton at home. Um, they look like they're going to be certainly a, a very good side, but you just never know, dear. There's also the element of the shiny new thing to a degree about Tottenham Conte isn't there as, as long as some of the other managers around him mm-hmm. in those those top few clubs and I guess you could say something similar about Arsenal that it feels kind of like on vogue to say that, that Tottenham and Arsenal are, are going to maybe get into the top four and maybe people are sleeping on Chelsea just a little bit Mark it, it kind of feels like we've forgotten that they've won the Champions League yeah. a couple of seasons ago some of the new signings looked excellent last weekend uh, could, could they be the ones really out of that that chasing pack to really put the pressure on the top two well, well, the way the, the way they're going about signing players, and obviously the, the window's still open for a bit, and you know, with the new owner coming in, it seems as though it's money, no object. So, I wouldn't mind betting by the end of the transfer deadline that they might have another two or three, mm. and they won't and they won't be players like, oh yeah, well we bought him just you know, to, to, he's going to be good in about eighteen months. They will be ready made. I don't think there's any doubt about that whatsoever. So it's very much with them as well. I think I watch this space and. Um, you know, they've got a good manager, as we know. They're going to be very, very organised. That's part of two called badge. And if they get the players in, it's the forward players, isn't it? That's the rest of the team looking at the way they're going. And if you sign to Fana from, uh, from Leicester City as well, the, the rest of the team looks very good, compact. They know the way that they play. Thiago's still a very good player, reads, reads the game fantastically. But it's up front. Goals win your games, as everybody knows. And, you know, look at the fuss over Haaland last week. And, and quite rightly so, but they don't have anybody like him, and that's going to be maybe going to be the problem. Who the act they can actually get in that's going to score the goals to get them in the top three or even in the top two. What's your take on how that will shake out? Then I presume you're going City and Liverpool as your top two. Yeah. How do you see the teams, and and how do you see the order of the teams behind them? Well, um, I would I would say you know because it's Conti. I just think that they'll, they'll finish third. I think it's between them and uh, and Chelsea. I don't. I look at Arsenal. Yes, they signed some good players, but they don't convince me as yet. Even even in their first game against Palace, Palace had quite a few opportunities at, at one nil down. Um, it's obviously it's a good start for them because it's a difficult place to go, as everybody knows now. Crystal Palace, but I'm not convinced by them. Um, Man United. I don't think they can be anywhere near looking at them. There's so much work to do there. West Ham just don't have basically the players that are going to get them in the top four. Uh, am I missing anybody? No, I don't think I am. Am I thinking that's probably about it? Maybe the Amazon documentary will change your mind on Arsenal. Um, well, I haven't seen it. 
Any good? <laughs> it's pretty good to be fair, but uh, I mean, uh, like you could you could be persuaded. You can check it out, and we'll get you on again, Mark, to to, right, to, to okay. chat through it. Yeah, I'll have, I'll have a I'll have a look at it. I didn't even know they made one, but I mean, <laughs> they're all they're all. It's, it's the thing about it. It's it's the good bits and the bad bits from the documentaries, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and also I guess the club gets you know it welcomes a, a, a lot of filmmakers into the to the club. So I'd always be conscious that it's maybe too glowing a representation of a manager or, or a set of players sometimes. Yeah. Um, but listen, I mean, you know, I mean, he, he signed some good players, Arteta, but um, I just don't, you know, Arsenal are very much kind of win three or four games and then likely to to lose a couple and draw a couple. That's the way that they've been, and it's it's not just quality of the players. I think it's a mentality. Um, you know, I mean, when they came when they came to Liverpool last year, I don't know if you remember, but they were playing really well for about 25 minutes, and then Arteta and uh, Klopp had a had a row on the uh, on the touchline, and Arsenal completely lost it. It was like, wow, it was just just over a row between two managers, and you're thinking, hmm, I'm not sure between the years that they're ready to actually be such a good team. Mm. I think something that happened there as well. It sort of riled up the crowd at Anfield yeah. even more. So yeah. I, th- I think that's one thing you don't do when you're going to Anfield. No, no, absolutely. When you talk through your top six there, I get the sense that maybe you're not even convinced Manchester United are, are definitely going to be in there, or, or are you? Like, are, are you? No, think, is that are they I vulnerable? Think by, I think by hook or by crook, they, they will they will get there. Okay, but just just I mean, like everybody watching the game last week for the first ten or fifteen minutes, they looked okay. But I mean, Br- Brighton. Um, were so very good against them, and they, they'd, they tactically they just completely outplayed them. And I just think the thing with, with Manchester United, there is so much work to do. But I think also the mind has to convince all the players about the way that they want to play. And you know that just doesn't happen in weeks; it takes months. And also, if, if he thinks that the people in there aren't good enough, he's going to have to change the personnel, which he's, he's currently trying to do. I mean, who's going to play up front for them? Who's going to score all their goals? So. It's such an easy one. I mean, and to be fair, with, with Ronaldo, you know, love him or hate him, when he came on, he, he looked the most lively of anybody. But of course, he wants to go, and just a, a whole thing is a massive, massive problem. Mm. It feels like the same problems that we were picking through last April still exist right now, and yeah. I guess that speaks to just deeper issues at the club. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, it's it's. Uh, I have this theory, rightly or wrongly, but when, when, when Fergie finished, David Gill finished with him. Now, now David Gill was, and I know him, he's just a, a great, great operator in terms of players in, players out. He'd been at the, been at the job a long, long time. And uh, when Edward Woodward got in, he'd, he would got all the sponsorship. So he, I think he convinced the Americans that you know he was such a good operator and they thought, well, let's let him get in charge of the football rather than rather than everything else. And he just wasn't up to it. And consequently, they're, they're paying the price because, you know, the, the buying and selling has just been, well, it's just been ordinary in the be- at the best. Like, the questions then will remain over, like, what are they going to do in midfield? And it, and it feels mm-hmm. that their transfer policy has been unbelievably reactive, that Frankie de Jong and that situation, of course, a lot of that was out of their hands, but they've allowed that to drag on all season. And it feels like the Adrian Rabio links are now very reactive and I guess before you get to that point you're looking at a starting midfield last weekend of Fred and McTominay and Manchester yeah. United fans must be thinking how are we in this endless cycle of misery absolutely and and you know it, it looks like it looks to me like there's been a list of players that they want and now they're probably about down at six or seven on that list for the players and as you as you as you rightly say they're just reacting to the fact that you know they can't get your man, so they go and try and get somebody else. That just doesn't seem to be the basis of a plan. Um, in, and I'm just looking at them. I mean, it, defensively, they were defensively. It was just really, really strange. I mean, two centre backs looked like they just met, which you know, in all honesty, probably only have done about two or three weeks ago. So he's got to start from the back. The goalkeeper is obviously a top goalkeeper, but you really he's going to have to start from the back forwards. Because they were so easy to get at. I mean, Brighton could have won, you know, three, four, five. So he's got that problem first before anything else. Before he's even got to think about strikers, about midfield players, and all. And it's just a, a massive, massive job. And now, as everybody knows, they're going to try and buy players. And if, if you're a, 
you're a chief executive of top football club and you know that Manchester United won't want to play, you're going to ask for absolute fortune. So it's a real, real difficult position that they're in. But, and it's of their own making, unfortunately. Yeah, you, you say that by hook or by crook they'll get to sixth, but if you had to pick a team that'll push them all the way and, and maybe try and disrupt that top six, who would it be? Like, like I mean, you look at Leicester and West Ham who have at least a muscle memory of going the distance and pushing the top four over the past couple of seasons and well, then Newcastle have all the money and Brighton show that they're, they're going to be a quality team this season as well. So is there anybody in that collection of teams that, that you think could could push the top six? No. Okay. No, there isn't. Um, look, at, look, I mean, what's happening at Leicester? Every, everybody's trying to get out, jump ship. Um, I don't think up to now they haven't, they haven't bought anybody, have they? So, which is a really strange one. Uh, have they, have they, you know, they've got um, a brand new training ground, which they've spent absolute fortunes on. Is, is the owner looking at that and thinking, we need to recap some of the money? Well, it looks like it at the moment, because, you know, all their better players, there's offers for them to take them by all the different clubs. So that's a real worry. And um, who else did we say? I mean, Newcastle probably... If they finish top 10, uh, looking up to about eight, that would be a good season for them. But they, they've been cute as well, by the way, in, in their signings. They've not gone out and spent absolute fortunes. They've, they've been quite clever, and it, it's a really softly, softly catchy monkey approach, and it's, and it's working, I think, for them. I, don't, just don't, I just don't see anybody else. I think that would be one of the stories of the season, which is like 6 to 12 will be interchangeable throughout the, what, eight, nine months of the football season. Yeah, I think that's probably spot on when we look at how the next little while will pan out. Just wanted to ask you about Liverpool as well, Mark. Uh, mm. la- last weekend, obviously, the, the big talking point uh, probably was, was Darren Nunez's uh, debut, but, but really it's Thiago's injury, isn't it? That, that is the, the big talking yeah. point for, from Liverpool's perspective. So w- was there a little bit of an alarm bell going off anyway with regards to the reinforcements that, that, that they haven't, I guess, acquired in midfield and, and how well stocked they are in that department? Yeah, well, I think if you you know if if you look at the three departments of, of the team, so you know defensively including the goalkeeper, obviously, and then and, and the front players, the front three, who we think they will be regularly, they, they're outstanding. But the, but the midfield at the moment has a little bit of look of, of average, average about it without Thiago because I mean, Thiago is such an outstanding player and he sees passes that other mortals don't see, but he's prone to injuries and. Um, that's not going to go away as he gets a little bit older and, and, and you look at them. And I know a couple of young lads, uh, Harvey Ellett and stuff, I think they think oh, they've given him a brand new contract, haven't they, yesterday, I think. And they, and they think he's got a real chance that you wouldn't want to play him every single week. So they look, there's, there's, a, there's a little bit of a look in midfield, like the ordinary cater. Has he ever really done it? Probably not. So... I mean, Henderson's a good player, and you know what you're going to get from him week in, week out. But there's, there's, there's no, there's no kind of X factor in that midfield at the moment. Whether, whether they decide to go out and buy somebody um, remains to be seen. They've done this before, when you know all of a sudden they've produced a rabbit out of the hat with Allison and, and Van Dyke and things like that. But um, it's an, it's an interesting one because, as I said, there's, there's no X factor in there. Cater's. I mean, his case has been there is his fourth or fifth season. I don't think we've ever seen him really play like you know outstanding games on a on a regular and consistent basis. So it's it's a small problem. It's not a massive problem. But if you're seriously going to cha- uh, challenge Manchester City, you might have to address it before the end of the transfer window. Yeah, it does feel like we're we're constantly talking about the midfield area that that's mm. where they they need to strengthen. But Mark, what would you do like at the moment if there is no maybe X factor player out there at the minute to sign? Is it better to wait till you you see that that player you really want to spend the, the money on on him, or is it a problem right now? We need we need to fix it now. Well, I think there's, there's quite a few injuries in there which I think Fluff alluded to. So it, it, that sounds to me like they're, they're going to stick with it. Um, as I said, they've got big hopes about Harvey Elliott. Um, he's sort of recovered from his injury, etc. It, it's, it, they've always been they've been very, very clever, Liverpool, since Klopp been there. Since Klopp been there in, in, in the transfer market, um, sometimes I mean, look, look at Jota. Who knew Jota was going to sign for the football club? All of a sudden, he'd arrived at Liverpool, and there's an announcement that they signed him. Nobody even knew, which is unbelievable nowadays with, with the media, etc. So, I would imagine that they're looking round. Um, they'll have a list of players as well who, who they think they like to take, whether they can take them in terms of the money, all those all those kind of things. Um, just we have to wait and see. I mean, it's like anything. If I think they play Palace on Monday, don't they? And if he slips up against Palace, I think I think 
the phone call to America would be very, very urgent. Yeah, it was a pretty poor performance for their, their first game out against Fulham. They were nearly lucky to get a draw, I would have thought. Yeah. Yeah, they, well, they were sluggish, weren't they? They, they, they were sluggish. They had, they had a spell when it got to 1-1 where you kind of thought, go on then, go, go on and win the game. But obviously Mitrovic um, managed to get the penalty, certainly, for, for Fulham. I don't take anything away from Fulham. I thought they were very good and very, very competitive as well. It's the most competitive Fulham team I've seen for years and years because they normally roll over and lie down in front of you a bit. Yeah, they just, just, they just weren't at it. Um, so... Obviously, Monday's game is a big game, and already people are saying, "Oh, you know, City's won. They look brilliant. Harland, they're going to absolutely walk the league, and etc." Et but look, you know, 37 more games to go, long season, injuries, all those loss of form, all those kind of things. It, the, the the front two will be Manchester City and Liverpool, and um, whether Liverpool can hold on to City's coattails remains to be seen. Yeah, and we we mentioned Darwin Nunes coming off the bench in mm. each of the games. He's done really well. Do you think that maybe Osala's game might change a little bit with Nunes up front with him? No, I think I think he'll just be the same. I think um, certainly in the last eighteen months, I would say Mo Salah's game has become more well-rounded. I, I, there was always a, a, a part of me thinking that you know he just wanted to score every week. Uh, sometimes that you know, but not passing or getting his head up to play somebody else in. But I think that. That's changed a little bit. He's obviously got his new contract. He's happy, um, you know. And I, I think and he scored his goal last week. That they all they all all want to score. I mean, if strikers don't score, they don't think they play, do they? But Nunes is going to be a top player. I think everybody can see that. And what we might have is between those two, certainly at least um, going for the going for like top goal scorer, which is very very healthy. Obviously, I mean the top the top players. Liverpool is still a top top side. It may be not quite be as good as Manchester City at the moment. And Mark, for you, it's the first time I think in I think you spent twenty years at the BBC. It's the first time now you're watching on without being a, a pundit um, mm. and predicting. How has that been? Um, well, it's all right. Twenty five years apparently. Oh. I, didn't, I didn't. I didn't. Yeah, no. I, didn't, <laughs> I, I can't listen. I can't remember yesterday, so don't worry about it. But um, yeah, it's good. I've just. Uh, I don't need to see it. I've just done this thing with Paddy Power which is a, a, a massive skit on what I did at the BBC in terms of the predictions. So um, have, a, have a look at it. So I uh, quite enjoyed it as well. But no, listen, um, I'm still working. I work, I work at Liverpool doing most of the games, etc. So I get to see loads of games. So it, it's it's all good and spend more time in Mallorca as the winter approaches. <laughs> Very nice. No, no, uh, no Mark Lawrence and no classified results. Saturdays just ain't the same anymore. Uh, Listen, uh, what a what a decision that is, and I know like I'm one of the old farts and everything, but it's like, it was just it's five minutes, and you know the BBC's explanation that oh, there's a game at five thirty, and and the fact that nobody from the football department actually said oh this is why we're doing it, they were hiding behind this other excuse is just just amazing, and there's been obviously a massive outcry over here, and people saying well you can get it on here, you can get it on there, but like. You know, when you go to games, I mean, if I don't see Liverpool, I go and watch Preston. And, and sometimes I might leave a little bit early because it might be a bit boring, to be honest with it. But you, what you do is you jump in the car, you know, 10 to 5, the games are still going on. And you're listening to the commentary, but you're getting all the scores coming in and the results. It's, it's life. It's football. It's what we do. Yeah. yeah, like can you ex- explain? Like it's it's obvious. Like what what you just said there is why there's been such an outcry. But the the level of of the outcry this week was was actually quite notable. I thought this was something that might you know uh, be phased out and then nobody would say much about it. But I'm really surprised by the the, the backlash this week. Can you can you try mm. and put into words about wh- why we've seen that level of backlash? Well, because I I just think people look at it and and listen. You know. We live in an age where, where woke is very much every day, every, everything about it. And, every, you know, you can't say stuff and all that kind of... It's just one of those strange, strange things that I just feel somebody in the ivory tower at the BBC has decided, well, we, we, we don't need to do that. Now, it can't be a financial thing because it's just one person reading the results for eight minutes. So I... I, I you know, and as I said before, the fact that nobody from the football department actually said, well, this is the reason why. So they're obviously, they, I would think, would completely disagree with the decision. But in the end, they've had um, not nothing to say about it, but no say in mm. terms of 
you know, the big buses at the BBC, which is just, just a very, very strange thing. But then if you if you look across, um, lots of people at, at the BBC are, uh, you know, approaching older age, shall we say, uh, they're starting to lose their jobs. So you know, make out of that what you wish. Forgive me for... Um for forgetting James Alexander Gordon was that the, the reader of the, the, the no Charlotte Charlotte Sorry. Green was the last one James James Alexander Gordon was on for years for years, years yeah ah oh, man what a what a voice as well unbelievable but Charlotte Charlotte Green was the last one and um, which, which which you know we think about it I think she might have done ten years now but that was like whoa a woman reading the football results whatever next which is nuts isn't it because and she had a great voice and she was really really good at it so ah uh, I don't know. You know, as you get older, you kind of look at stuff and you think, oh, my God, is that really what's happening to the world? Yeah, yeah. Um, It's certainly been a a big story this week. Mark, listen, it's been great chatting to you once again this morning. Thanks, million, for taking the call. No problem. Thank you. See you later. See you after. Bye. Bye, Mark. Bye-bye. Mark Lawrence in there on the line looking ahead to the weekend's Premier League and uh, on that theme just to tell you that Off the Ball is coming back to Vicker Street in association with Cabri FC and we've got a massive road show coming your way in just five days time it's Wednesday August 17th we've got Mike Lowe and Ian Wright Emma Byrne and Karen Carney amongst our guests there should be some great stories in the night as four legends of the game reminisce about their careers and preview this season and look ahead to the, to the games um, that are coming up so this is an exclusive off-air event and tickets are limited so don't delay you can go to otbsports.com forward slash events. And a reminder that ticket proceeds will go towards supporting Irish women's grassroots football. Terms and conditions apply. See you on the night. Uh, right, we are back after the break with former tennis professional Jenny Claffey in studio on what made Serena Williams so great. But before that, here is Stephen Doyle speaking to Tim Clancy following St. Pat's heartbreaking loss to Seska Sophia in Europe last night. Tim, just on those chances in and around the box, was it kind of frustrating maybe that Owen wasn't the man getting onto some of those chances that he could have finished? No, listen, it's, it's we players with energy getting into, <coughs> sorry, getting into the box. Um, and no matter who it is, Serge has, scores a great goal out there on last Thursday and then he gets one on one this time and the keeper makes a good save. So um, we're just happy to create any chances, to be honest with you. And whoever it falls, we're just hoping that they can take it. Um. And uh, we were fortunate to be there tonight. I'm sure you planned for perhaps maybe going to goal down in, in the game. And what was the message to the players? Were you happy with the way they reacted? Because you really controlled the game from there on in after the, the goal in the 11 minutes. Yeah, listen, uh, you expect uh, a different CSKA this, this week than they were last week. Um, they moved the ball a lot quicker. Did a lot more inter, interplay with, their, with the players up front. Um, but I thought after probably a hectic 15, 20 minutes, we settled into the game. We started finding uh, <coughs> players uh, going forward and then... Um, Obviously, the second goal, I think it's, uh, it's a killer. It's a, it really is. and They won't have to come out now and explain the decision why a free kick's given in front of the dugout. No idea why it is. Um, and then again, when you look at it back, you've seen it on the video, it looks like it hits Garces' hand first before it goes onto Hardy's hand. So, again, really quick to put the whistle in his mouth and give uh, the bigger club the decision. Did you speak to any of the officials? <laughs> no, not really. It's not worth your while. It was chaos after the game. Um, a load of stuff going on so it's just Mark getting players out of the way and getting them into the dressing room and, and I went in to speak to them there but I wasn't allowed OTB AM This is OTB Sports Radio OTB Sports in association with Cabri FC are returning with a monster football roadshow coming your way August 17th Football Legends Michael Owen If you haven't got that attitude then you'll never survive Ian Wright Lots to look forward to Emma Byrne That's normal, that's all in the game Level is gone for the roof And Karen Carney will be our guest at Vicker Street As they look back on their playing days and preview the new 2022-2023 season This is an exclusive off-air event and tickets are limited so don't delay go to otbsports.com forward slash events and remember that the ticket proceeds will go towards supporting Irish women's grassroots football T's and C's apply see you on the night if your business relies on a van that wouldn't sound good but this does get up to 75% off van insurance now available in FPD branches nationwide FPD insurance support it's what we do 75% 75% no claims discount based on five years claims free. Available on new van policies used for farm or business purposes. Terms and conditions apply. Underwritten by FPD Insurance PLC. FPD Insurance Group Limited trading as FPD Insurance is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Things that put people off on a first date. Showing up late and getting your name wrong. Always a great start. Looking at their phone more than you. 
Uh, hello. Someone who only talks about themselves. Oh, really? God, aren't you great? Look, no one said dating is perfect, but at godating.ie, we promise we'll always try and find your perfect match. Because somewhere out there, there's someone for you. And godating.ie will help you find them. Yes, even you, socks and sandals guy. Go on, go for it with godating.ie. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. It is 19 minutes past 8 here with us here on OTBAM. We're with you here until 10 o'clock this morning and it's brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Right, we are turning our attention back to the news this week that Serena Williams has retired from professional tennis. Delighted to say that uh, ex-professional tennis player and uh, current coach Jenny Claffey is with us in studio. Jenny, how are you getting on? Yeah, very good, yeah. It's some disappointing news this week to hear the retirement of Serena Williams anyway. Sad day for tennis. But I was just going to ask, like, is your initial disappointment based on the fact that she won't get to the record now? Is it based on the fact that it's just the end of a great career or, or, or what informs that disappointment? I think it's an end of, of an era for, mm-hmm. for for tennis. You know, the Williams sisters, well, Serena Williams leaving the game, you know, what an iconic athlete she has been for the last two decades. You know, she has transcended the sport and impacted so many people across the world um, and as her legacy will continue for generations to come. So I think based on that, it's it's very sad day for tennis as I said but then also for the game missing that big star in the women's game is going to be a big loss How visible was that impact when you were coming through the professional ranks on what she had in the game I'm not sure does that come across stylistically or, or in other ways but, but how did you measure that impact? When I was growing up, yeah. when I was playing, she was a complete idol for me. You know, um, the way I based my game was on her style. Like her, she was such an athletic woman. I wanted to be that strong and powerful like her. Her stro- strokes were so powerful. Her serve was really big. You know, I wanted to be just like her growing up. And you could see she was so dominant in the game. And kind of when I she came onto the tour in the 90s I was just a kid then so I followed her progress the whole way through my playing career and always looked up to her so you know she's just an incredible athlete and an amazing tennis player What defined her game? Her on court yeah. um, her serve I'd say was the biggest factor in her game closely led by her forehand I'd say um, but her serve was just so dominant in the game and when they came onto the tour they said they revolutionised the women's game they brought this power the, the Williams sorry they brought this power game um, style of, of tennis um, with the serve she revolutionised it with the fact that she was winning so many points with serve you know this unreturnable serve from oppositions so she'd be hitting banging down aces left right and centre you know and the opponents could not get the ball back or could not get a read on her serve so I think that was the starting factor then in her dominance and then the forehand closely follows behind Yeah it just seems that if you're trying to pick out any sort of weakness in the game at all you'd struggle to find a single one would you? Yeah I was saying her weaknesses possibly if you had to pick one would have been maybe fitness and footwork you know um, but her anticipation skills were so good that she got away with her footwork not being maybe the best in the world and maybe she struggled a little bit when she had injuries coming back to the game her fitness was a bit of an issue um, and, and some players were able to exploit that but not that many mm. thought it was nice as well here and how she spoke about venus and saying that if there, there was no venus there was no serena that the two of them really drove each other on yeah, I think that was a massive factor in Serena's success. Like there was a few environmental factors and that definitely was one of them. The fact that Venus was the leader and she was in her shadows and you could see when she was growing up that she always wanted to be better than than Venus. So that drove her and she admitted herself that she learned a lot from her mistakes and her losses, Venus, when she was playing on the tour. So she got to almost jump to the scene with all that experience as if she had played it herself. So she was a massive factor in her success. And the fact that they're sisters, they're both powerhouses, I think it shed such a light on on tennis for people that maybe never even watched the game before. You know, that you're like, wow, like these sisters doing this and they're the best at it. You know, I think at that point is when a lot of people paid attention to tennis. They maybe hadn't really had a massive interest before. Yeah, it's it's cool the fact that like these two sisters came along at the same time, pretty much like Venus joined the tour only a year and um, before Serena, and then they completely changed the game and took over. For the past two decades, they have been dominating the tennis game. You know, I think Serena has twenty three Grand Slams and Venus has seven. Like that's thirty Grand Slams plus sixteen in doubles together. You know, nearly fifty Grand Slams between them in the family. Like what an amazing achievement! 
So it also kind of like brings to like this this interesting conversation where you know some sports people need a great rival. Like say in the men's game, people are like you know it, it was only brilliant because you had Nadal to match your Federer and then Djokovic to a later extent. It doesn't seem like the women's game suffered all that much for there being an unrivaled superstar in the game. People were tuning in to watch one person. Yeah, it, it's incredible that that has happened and it's probably something that we're never going to see again in, in the women's tennis game, like a star like that who can dominate for so long. But the two of them definitely, I think, drove each other on and it was mm. great to see this rival. But I always felt there was a, le- a, a kind of a level of awkwardness when they played each other because the matches always seem to be quite subdued when they play each other in a Grand Slam final or in any big stage because, you know, who was going to win? And in the beginning, it was always Venus. And then once Serena beat her, I think she pretty much had the beating over over then and she rose to that stardom and, and stayed at the top the whole time. When you mentioned there a few minutes ago about her style and the, the power game that she brought to proceedings, what was the knock-on impact for a, a generation of tennis players? Like, Was there a lot of imitators trying to, to do that exact thing? I know you allude to yourself there, or, or did it actually have kind of a, an extra knock-on impact where people were kind of preparing themselves to come up against that power game and, and then they therefore had to come up with something new? Yeah, as I mentioned, like they revolutionised the game in terms of they brought that power game to the tour, whereas then the players had to adapt to that power style. So if you're going to try and beat somebody who plays with that amount of power, you either have to match them and be better than them at it, or you have to be an incredible defender. But if you're not defending well enough, they're just going to pick you apart. Like the Williams, they stay so close close to the baseline, take time away from the opponent. It's very difficult to play against somebody who plays like that. But then that has then sh- shaped the game for those past few decades. You know, everybody was playing that kind of aggressive ba- um, game style. Like if you look at the likes of Maria Sharapova, um, she was a very aggressive player, just like Williams. But Williams is always that bit better than her at that. So you see now in recent days, in the last year or two, this, the likes of Iga Sviantec and Ange Jabeur who play, play a different kind of game style because they've had to ed- evolve their games to try to beat the likes of Williams. So initially the Williams brought this power game and that's how the game was played for the last 20 years. And now we're seeing a different um, game style being brought. Like the women are much more um, diverse in how they play. They're able to play with power. They're able to defend well. They're able to play with drop shots and different types types of spins coming into the net so they've had to evolve the game to try to beat beat the Williams which has made the game much more interesting now It's fascinating so if I was to ask you 2017 Serena against the current peak player say against Fiontech currently how would that match go is it still Serena in, in dominant form or has the intervening five years led to an evolution in the game where there would genuinely be a rival to Serena that would be a great matchup because they've never actually met each other either yeah. of those players yeah I think that would be a really interesting match to see because you'd be seeing Sviantec throwing the kitchen sink at her you know trying everything against her to try and beat her but Sviantec is one of those players who's an incredible defender so she could actually maybe hold hold Serena um, back but I'm, I think if we receive Serena in full dominance like she would just wipe anyone off the court yeah the goat is the goat really at the, at yeah there's no it's, denying it's, it's uh, probably hard to make a case for anybody else like when you were coming through, did you think of playing Serena eventually? Did you, did you was that part of like your ambitions? Like when you said that she inspired you, did did you also think, geez, one day I could get on the same court as her? Yeah, that was part of it. You know, I was thinking that because when I was um, coming to to my peak in my professional career it would have been a time that she was playing so it would have been 2015 so she was still dominating the tour at that stage so the, the thoughts were there at the back of my mind if I'm going to win a Grand Slam I'm going to have to beat Serena Williams Yeah and how close did that ever come to happening or to, to playing or I should say Not close enough, close enough yeah. Yeah. Not close enough How would you have got on? Um, we would have been very similar game styles like as I said I, I, my, my game was based around how she played and we, I was a power player as well um, but she might have had the edge you know maybe just had the edge <laughs> <laughs> And the way she um, announced her retirement, well, she doesn't like to say retirement. I thought that was quite interesting, the way she said it, that she's evolving outside of tennis. Um, It was a really tough decision for her. She didn't want to have to make it. She feels like she almost had to make it. What did you make of all that side of things? Yeah, the way that she announced retirement is quite interesting. I find the fact that she's using this term evolving, you mm-hmm. know, it's obviously a very painful time for her to be leaving the sport behind. It, there's obviously a huge amount of passion still there, but there are other endeavours she obviously wants to pursue, including um, start having another child. And she alluded to that in her um, interview that, you know, if she was a male player, that male tennis player, she would be able to continue playing and her 
wife if that, in, in that situation mm-hmm. would be able to have the family so there's a, a bit of like a sting I think there for her and I, I, I do think it's it's really disappointing for her that she feels she can't go on anymore but I do think there are physical elements to that as well you know the fact that she's nearly 41 and her body she's had a few injuries over the last while so it's come at a right time I think in a way but it's just a, a disappointing Yeah she doesn't really mention those factors that you would think of of her age and mm. obviously your body over time you know it's yeah. just natural that that's what's what's going to happen but it's more the fact she wants to to push on and have maybe a bigger family have another child that's really the, the main reasons which just shows what unbelievable type of person she is like athlete wise her mindset like nothing can you know phase her yeah she's just but she's an all round incredible athlete like you see off court or individual as well off court she has you know she's an entrepreneur she's done amazing things for women's rights and um, for black American women she's really been very strong with that as well um, and then now she's kind of got that st- at that stage where she's ready to just move move into that direction of kind of following Serena's ventures I think and, and starting and having a, a bigger family so that the day has come unfortunately that that she's stepping away I think most people did want to see her get over the line in one of those what was the four finals that she got to over the, the last few years uh, but to, to what extent was actually getting to those finals as much of an achievement as some of the Grand Slams that she actually won yeah that's massive like the last four Grand Slam finals she's gotten to have been on the back of having her first child and she had a very traumatic pregnancy with, with her first child and getting to four finals I think everybody was gunning for her to win one more and match that Margaret Court 24 Grand Slams I mean it was heartbreaking to see she came so close um, to matching that um, 24, the elusive 24th Grand Slam mm-hmm. we'll say but it's a massive achievement to get to there like to get to any Grand Slam final once is a huge deal and she said herself that you know she feels like she could have won 30 plus Grand Slams but she turned up 23 times and won 23 Grand Slams so you know obviously it's still a fantastic achievement to make four Grand Slams, it's just such a shame she didn't get over the line Is there any debate in tennis circles about who the greatest women's tennis player is of all time? I think it's undeniably Serena Williams, I think the best tennis player in the, in yeah. the world, let alone female tennis player, it's definitely her And the, the Margaret Court thing just doesn't factor in at all? It's hard to compare the different eras. You know, um, Margaret Court won hers in when it was not the professional era. So, you know, there were less people travelling down to Australia, which is where she's from, and she won a lot of Grand Slams down there. So a lot of people weren't travelling to Australia to play those a lot of the players um, and then since then the game has completely like evolved in terms of technology and fitness and rackets equipment everything has evolved since then but it's very hard to, to compare the two but I still sure. think Williams is the GOAT um, Colin's got a question wondering which player was able to consistently get the best out of Serena Williams which is a good question other than Venus Williams mm. um, yeah. oh, I think Azarenka, Victoria Azarenka, she's a she was she pushed her. She was a very similar game style to her as well. And Sharapova. I think the two of them probably were the two who who kind of went toe to toe with her. And um, I'm not picking one there. I think the two of them were probably probably the two closest rivals for her who could have you know pushed her more and more. Why was that? Their games were quite similar to the way that she played maybe their fitness were, was a little bit better than her in times because um, Sharapova won seven Grand Slams as well so uh, you know she obviously had the game and to, to beat Williams and, and has beaten Williams in finals as well so I think yeah they, they match up well but, but over a longer period of time consistently Williams was the better player Is this definitely it? Like, a, like I mean, we talk about the the strange language around uh, the the retirement article, the retirement book that basically was we printed it off. Um, are we sure that this is definitely going to be the last we see of her in a court? Never say never. Yeah, I think so. That's what I would think. Yeah, I just mean, the way she worded it, I was like. And how she is so off. passionate about tennis and winning and competing. It's going to be very hard for her to match that in her life outside of sport. So where is she going to get that? That you know, Where's that need going to be met? So maybe we might see a comeback. Yeah, yeah she's such a competitor, like a ferocious competitor. So exactly. she needs to fill that somehow. Yeah. So you wouldn't be surprised if she did have another child, then you could maybe... Year back Give again. her two years, maybe, and yeah. she'll be back. But hopefully, <laughs> the US Open this year goes her way, and she can match Margaret Court's twenty-four. Oh, that'd yeah. be amazing! Yeah. Wouldn't that just be a way to see her off? Absolutely. Uh, also, as well, there's you. You presume a, a very uh, like um, 
uh, full on coach in her future down the line as well if she wanted that because like I'm sure that the competitive drug needs to be uh, obtained from somewhere after she does after she, she does I don't think away. a coach though would would ma- would be enough for her she'd want True. to be out there playing herself you know because nothing beats that feeling of like when you're out on a match court and the nerves in your tummy and the excitement and the crowd you wouldn't get that as a coach it's just mm. not the same she has her little girl out on the court a little bit with her so yeah. you never know there could be another but she did say in her interview that she she would she wouldn't necessarily pick tennis for her yeah. daughter but whatever she wants to, to, to do, do she's put her in it so it's mm. interesting that she doesn't necessarily want to push her into tennis yeah I feel the same as well actually I wouldn't oh, really? think I would why do you think yeah. that it's just a very tough sport like it's individual sport you know and you have to have the personality or to, to be that driven and individual and self selfish to pursue uh, an individual sport whereas I, I just think it's a very tricky lifestyle and the path to it is very difficult and you know I just think I'd have them team sports first and then maybe to switch to golf because you'll make more money that way <laughs> <laughs> It does seem tennis is particularly taxing on the mind like as as far as all individual sports are but it feels like the, the stories we hear from tennis are particularly um, grim at times in terms of what the lengths you need to go to to actually make it yeah it's, it's a really tough sport there's no denying that let alone the fact that it's an individual sport there's just so much involved in it like it obviously it's all encompassing you, your life becomes the sport and um, but it's one of those sports that you win you have a big win today and then you get to enjoy it for about 10 minutes and then you're back on because you've got to face another opposition the next day so it's a very very short celebratory period and a very long loss like when you lose you suffer it much more than you enjoy the winning because there's always the next day and the next opposition it's very back to back that's what I found really tricky when I played on the tour was that you know you win you come off this and you're elated and then all of a sudden it's like okay I need to prepare for tomorrow and then you that come down so there's lots of highs and lows in the game and there seems to be obviously now a lot of injuries which are impacting a lot of players you hear the the how difficult that is and how you just all of a sudden you know you're at the top your game you get injured and then you drop off that's happened to a number of players and they never regain the same level that they did before it's just so it's a very difficult sport so destroying at times yeah can it be a lonely sport at times I didn't even mention that but that is one of the hardest things as well is like you're initially like when I started my career for example I was travelling alone you couldn't afford to have a coach you couldn't afford to have anyone there with you I went to a foreign country didn't speak the language didn't know anybody and it's like where do I go from here? And then, as I said, if you lose, it's even worse than you're on the phone to people. It's not the same. You're at dinner on your own. It's just really quite a lonely place to be when you lose, especially when you win. You kind of you can you can deal with it a bit better. But yeah, it's a, it's a lonely, tough sport. Yeah. Not to put people off the game. Yeah. Though. <laughs> yeah. It's brought yeah. me so much happy memories as well. Yeah, of course. Uh, I think that's probably a, a pretty good prediction that that Serena may not be. Uh, pushing her kids into the sport too much unless they're uh, they could well be just gifted like her as well and that could be uh, a natural conclusion listen Jenny great stuff great insight thanks very much for, for joining us in studio yes, this morning thanks, guys. Uh, right ahead of our uh, Cabri FC Roadshow on August 17th we're going to be deciding the top five most influential Irish players in both the men's and women's game a reminder that tickets for the show in Vicar Street are on sale now and ticket proceeds will go towards supporting Irish women's grassroots football you can see otbsports.com forward slash events for T's and C's and more We'll see you on the night. Right now, here's more reaction from last night in St. Pat's narrow defeat with Stephen Doyle talking to past midfielder Jamie Lennon. Jamie, what's your kind of overriding feeling about the, the match tonight? Because it seemed like you were getting into their final third, controlling the game for quite large parts, but just couldn't get that final finish into the back of the net. Yeah, you're right. We had plenty of chances, probably had the better chances in the game, but um, we just didn't take them tonight. Like I said, you couldn't fault anyone's attitude and you know performance levels and energy we gave. I think we got the crowd on our side from minute one, for a couple of tackles, and the crowd were up for it. And you know we fe- we fed off that on the pitch, but it just it just didn't happen for us tonight. And it's disappointing. What do you put that down to? Just not taking our chances. Probably um, they're a good side. You got to respect them. You know I don't, I don't think even though we are one up, a lot of people probably didn't give us a chance tonight. And it was going to be a tough ask, we knew it was, but we still had the belief in the squad that we'd, we'd go and put on a performance. And I think if you if you seen the dressing room now, you'd understand the belief we had in ourselves because the lads are good. But we've got to bounce back now, massive game on Sunday. So. And before the penalty, uh, was there a feeling amongst you as players where you're thinking, let's get to this to extra time, or was it, no, let's try and find a winner here before the 90 minutes? 
Not really. I mean, uh, we had good chances second half. Anto's in at the back post. He connects with that. That's a goal. Uh, Serge was put through on goal as well. Uh, Doyle had a flick of a header as well. So we had plenty of chances. And we always felt like we'd get chances against them because there was a lot of space on the counter-attack. But look, like I said, it just didn't happen tonight. Just got to move on now. And matching a team with that quality, does it give you real motivation for the rest of the season now? Yeah, it does. I mean... Mora were a good side themselves and getting through that probably gave us the belief we could, you know, put up against most teams in the in the, the competition. So when we were drawn against CSK it was uh, we still had the belief in the squad that we can go over there and get a result and we were just we were just disappointed we couldn't go all the way tonight. There's a sense to you know, to, to be back here next year you have to push on in the league. Mm. Um, that's not always a task over the next next few months, but there's this real belief for sure in that dressing room. Yeah, definitely. And um, getting a little taste of it now, what you can do in Europe definitely gives lads that extra edge to go and try and, you know, finish as high as we can up the table and be here again next year. It's the first thing the gaffer said after the game was we want more nights like this and I think everyone down there enjoyed the last couple of weeks and we want to be back here next year so it's important now. We've got to, you know, we'll feel it tonight, but when we wake up tomorrow, we've got to be looking ahead to Sunday because it's massive. What was it like on the game after the four games with the team? This is one that we've got to wait for. Uh, yeah, a bit. Right now, if you ask me tomorrow, I don't know what I'll say. Looking up, I'll watch it back, but right now it's, it's hard to take, considering, like I said, we had the better chances and thought we played quite well. Um, it's football. It happens. Yeah, do you not do not feel like you're almost playing against another man? Sometimes the referee, when you're, you're trying to win balls back and stuff like that, he was giving fouls and you know soft yellows and like. I think we'd be fair for that talk, but the officials and team said enough. No, that's all right. It was the build up. It was obviously very disruptive. Was that a factor at all? Um. I mean, like it was obviously a, a hectic couple of days, but I think once we were at home and we got rested up, we were fine. Had a couple of good training sessions coming in today. Everyone's fresh, um, no real injuries or anything. Everyone felt good going into the game, so I don't think you can use any of that as an excuse. These critics, these pundits. I absolutely adore them, lads. I have unbelievable time from, but they're, they're a great bunch, but it's not acceptable. I'd like to play the hard man when, when they're on it. It's not very pleasant when you're trying to manage a team. All you're looking for is a bit of civility and a bit of decency, but they just dismiss you like, like you, you know, you have nothing to do with the bloody occasion. Yeah, three voices that have been in the sports news quite a lot over the last few weeks. Will O'Callaghan tweeted last night, Liam Kearns, Davy Fitz and Kevin McStay all feature on OTP's Quick Picks jingle. Two of them have got new jobs this evening with McStay amongst the candidates for Mayo with a photograph of Disco Stew giving the pistols to Homer Simpson. We'll come back to those managerial uh, decisions in just a moment. Great tweet, Will. You're very welcome. How are you? Yeah, two or three ain't bad, I guess, is the way the song goes. And if these trends continue, is what Disco Stew is saying to Homer Simpson. So I'm not ah. sure if that's a guarantee that Kevin McStay is going to be in charge of Mayo for next season. But yeah, um, the first two voices have both picked up new jobs overnight. Thank you for filling in the blanks on my uh, absent Simpsons knowledge on, on that occasion. <laughs> uh, we do have more pressing matters. We have the leaderboard from this season's Quick Picks. Apparently there's some drama here. Apparently I finished... Uh, well, no, I didn't. I thought, no, they did me dirty there. I found third on the list and I thought I finished third. So here's what's after happening. I finished last, obviously. I'm terrible at this. I know oh. absolutely nothing and I'm pathetic at predictions. Adrian finished second last. I even finished below Adrian Barry. Unbelievable. 63%. Uh, Ashling and Will both finished joint second. And Tommy finished 76%, but he didn't submit picks for weeks one and three. So how is this fair? Null and void. <laughs> Well, I thought there was supposed to be some sort of like drama where we had some conclusive evidence that yes, there was a I winner. Was the, yeah. the first week of the championship where all these teams are thrown together, nobody has got any form. Tommy was just like, I'm going to uh, tactically opt out of this one. And same with the third one. It was tactical. It was tactical. It fully was. I don't take that. I think it's me and Will that won. Well, if you consider that pretty much nobody dropped points or there were very few points that were dropped from pretty much the semi-finals on, 
all of the points were dropped in the first few weeks of the championship where we had the surprise results, which was the time I think that Tommy Rooney was sitting in New York and didn't take the time to even send an email and send in his quick picks. So I think if we're going to have a rule for next season where we don't have to look at percentages and you know people in the background having to go back through the mats and to work out you know who got a certain amount based on however amount of picks, you have to submit your picks even if you're away. There will be weekends where we're not available, where we're not here on a Friday. Yeah. Everyone has to put their picks in for next season. Well, like, I mean, a very good example of this, of, like, uh, exemplary behaviour is, say, for example, if you're in New York and you've got a massive life moment such as getting engaged <laughs> and you still find time to send in your picks. I mean, that's that's what people should do. I didn't see Tommy Rooney getting engaged when he was over in uh, in New York. I didn't see him down on one knee. <laughs> still, <laughs> the pressure didn't, find on time, <laughs> didn't find any time to send in his quick picks. Absolutely disgraceful return. And uh, just in case... Yeah, anybody, so do we disqualify him? I, th- I think so. And just in case anybody's wondering, there is a relegation system in this. I will not be in the, the quick picks next year. And uh, good riddance won't to be me. It. I, I will not be in the quick picks ah, next year. Oh. So that's the pure relegation from from this table but congratulations to, Joe to, to Tommy yes exactly uh, congratulations to Tommy on, on your success we were really really happy for you and uh, you get some sort of um, <laughs> you get some sort of uh, a, a reward Shifty Lad has actually just made that point as well Ash has just got engaged and contributed poor from Tommy so um, <laughs> he's qualified <laughs> it's tainted at best <laughs> yeah I actually, wish he was on this call so much <laughs> I think uh, he's getting engaged this weekend yeah, he is. No, definitely. Chalk it down. We've all spoiled Congratulations it. in advance. So uh, I'm going to the quick picks and I'm getting engaged. Uh, Will, are you happy with your results? Ah, uh, yeah. Look, I had an absolutely horrific start. I think the first three or four weeks I did terribly, but I got all four All Ireland winners correct. So, in many ways, okay. who's the real winner when you're able to get the big ones right at the end? Um, so, yeah, I think um, I'm definitely ruling this as a bit like the Committee Shield. Ashton and I have shared this. I'm not uh, accepting Tommy's win. That is my narrative from here. And yeah, that means that three years in a row I've been at the top of the leaderboard. Let's talk about something that's uh, not quite as important. It is the managerial merry-go-round. How happy are you to be an Offaly person, Will? Yeah, it's unusual, isn't it? Like the idea was that Offaly were going to have a Kerry man called O'Shea that would be in charge for next year. And it looks like they're now going to have a Kerry man in charge of the footballers and O'Shea in charge of the hurlers. So uh, maybe not quite the initial plan, but it comes around in the end. I would be incredibly excited by the idea of Eamon O'Shea, Liam Sheedy and Johnny Kelly if that management team was to come to pass. I mean, even approaching this and trying to get them involved for next year shows remarkable ambition from a team who are going to be in Division 2A of the Hurling League and are going to be hurling in the Joe McDonough. Now, Liam Sheedy has been previously linked to the Offaly job between his two stints in charge of Tipperary. I'm not sure how hands-on Sheedy would actually be when you talk about you know, managers who've gone back to be successful. Obviously, he went back for his second stint with Eamon O'Shea involved in the Tipperary management team, which resulted in Or Ireland glory for them in 2019. And you would have never expected that they could be potentially managing outside the top flight just four seasons later but if they were to come in and particularly like Eamon O'Shea is a a remarkable hurling brain and was seen as you know a huge part of Tipperary's success and this is a chance for him now to perhaps step out in a full management role if he was to take over as Offaly manager I really didn't see this coming I mean all credit to Pat Nolan who broke this story uh, in the mirror yesterday so it's his report and I know that Offaly have been, you know, actively searching for a hurling manager with the intention of having them in charge in time for the start of the knockout stages in the Faithful County in a couple of weeks' time. Um, after they made the decision, after a pretty long summer of kind of going back and forth uh, about Michael Fenley and whether he was going to be in charge for next season, and then, you know, eventually pulling the trigger and not giving him a fourth season a couple of weeks ago, um, the feeling was that maybe they were going back to the drawing board. But it would show remarkable ambition by the county board and by Michael Dygan in particular if they could attract those two Tipperary. All-Ireland winners to come in and manage the team for next year and Johnny Kelly who was part of the coaching team with Michael Fenley for the last couple of years and who I really didn't think was going to be involved for 2023 but he would add an element of local knowledge quite aside from his coaching given that he's managed inside of Offaly in Tipperary in Galway but he has an intimate knowledge of Offaly hurling and has been part of the setup for the last two years so if a new management was to come in he would be the bridge to the new management and uh, a very exciting appointment but I would probably caution any Offaly supporters who are watching or listening to us this morning um, that we're still in the phase of this being potential rather than reality. Sure, that's that's a fair point. The ambition, though, is a, an interesting one. Like, what is the ceiling that O'Shea and Sheedy are looking at and thinking that's an attractive job? 
Yeah, I mean, the feeling would be that they'd be going into a team who should be competitive for the Joe McDonough Championship going into next season. They should have been competitive for the Joe McDonough this season, given that they had had a year in Division 1, which by the players and by Michael Fenley's own admission was very difficult from a physical point of view, particularly they shipped a tremendous amount of injuries in Division 1, which just goes to show the difference between you know playing in Division 2 and playing in the Christie Ring last year and then going on to play Division 1 hurling and play in the group that they were in, some of the best teams in the country. And then in the Joe McDonough, they got themselves by hook or by crook after some pretty exciting games and some very questionable defensive performances, were still in a position going into the last game against Carlo where they could have qualified for the final. Now, I still think if Offaly had reached the final, Antrim were hurling so well at the start of the summer that Antrim would have probably beaten them at Crow Park anyway. But the minimum target should have been to get to the Joe McDonough final. I think the minimum target for next year, if Sheedy and O'Shea were to come in as a management team, would be to win Division 2A of the league and to win the Joe McDonough. Again, I think Leash should be the favourites, but that would have to be the target if they were to come in. And look, there's the excitement of a few years away some good, awfully underage players that have been coming through. They got to an All-Ireland minor final this year, which they potentially could have won. It's very difficult to look into the crystal ball and see how many of those players are going to go on to become senior inter-county hurlers. But there's huge hope um, with at least half a dozen of them that there's massive potential there if it can be you know, just uh, brought through over the next couple of seasons, particularly with the under-20s. I think a lot of people are hopeful that Leo O'Connor might stay around and be part of the 20s setup as well. And similarly on the football side with Liam Kearns coming in, we saw the job that Liam Kearns did last with Tipperary after their success at Munster and getting to the All-Ireland in 2015 that that under-21 team were brought through under Liam Kearns they got to an All-Ireland semi-final they won promotion up to Division 2 of the league that perhaps Liam Kearns can do a similar job as the Offaly football manager again that's one that was not really intended by the county board at the outset of the summer I think all of the eggs were in the Thomas O'Shea basket and the second in line who would have been Declan Kelly the All-Ireland under-20 winning manager um, he was unavailable due to work commitments also involved with a few teams this summer too so it wasn't a possibility for him to come in even when Tomas O'Shea's uh, work situation changed around so I don't think many of us were expecting Liam Kearns to get the position but I can understand the logic that Offaly have gone with in appointing him uh, Just one other thing Will before we let you go Davy Fitz going back to Waterford is going to be the headline grabbing news of this week is this really really good news for Waterford? I don't know. I mean, it's a very mixed reception from what I saw mm. from Waterford supporters overnight. Like, this was the most attractive job that was available this summer. Like, I would put Waterford ahead of Tipperary, given Waterford's potential coming out of this season, where, look, in the championship, they disappointed, and they did not carry on their early season form. But you can't throw out the fact that Waterford were very impressive in the first few months of the season. The Waterford performance that we saw when they demolished Cork in the league final all of the talent that is available there, a Waterford team who've been to All-Ireland finals and semi-finals in recent seasons as well, who've got a decent age profile. This is a team who are now ready to deliver. And I, I guess that must be Waterford County Board's thinking of bringing David Fitzgerald in. That's like, we will bring in the motivator, the tactician, to maybe give us that extra few percentiles that perhaps we can turn near misses into actual silverware. As you pointed out earlier in the programme, David Fitzgerald was the manager the last time they won the Munster Championship. If you go back over a decade for Waterford actually landing silverware in Munster, that's how long the wait has been. And with that previous group of players who were very talented at the end of the uh, zero zeros as well, you know, he got them to be a consistent top four or five team within the country during the time that Davy was there. You can't write off the fact that Davy Fitzgerald then goes on to win an All Ireland Championship with Clare, goes on to get a breakthrough with Wexford in a Leinster Championship in 2019. Like his record speaks for itself. But then again, you have to take the point that many have made. I think James Scale numerous times in this program and on the hurling pod has made the point that teams generally tend to get a bounce in the first year with Davy Fitzgerald. Uh, the second year then becomes a little bit more difficult, and by the third year, usually that effect is waning somewhat. Maybe Waterford are thinking we cash in on what we have now and try and get Davy to bring us that extra few levels. I can understand some Waterford supporters' concerns, though, about the style of hurling, which was a little bit more freestyle, particularly under Liam Cal, compared to what Davy Fitzgerald is likely to use when he comes in for next season and over the next three seasons. And also, there's always that feeling of when you go back. Like, it's noteworthy for managers who go back and do well because they tend to be an exception rather than the rule. And you mentioned them earlier with Jack O'Connor and with Liam Sheedy. There's probably plenty of managements that we could talk about that have gone back in where it hasn't worked the second time round. So it's a very interesting appointment. It means that Dublin are still looking for a manager currently as well. Intrigued to see where that goes. Obviously, Eddie Brennan now won't be going to Waterford where he was heavily linked. I wonder if Eddie Brennan could potentially go to Dublin. And a bit like the transfer market in the Premier League, I kind of like the merry-go-round and all the conversations and the potential knock-on effects of who's going to go where. Because if Eamon O'Shea is, involved, is interested in going to Offaly, that means Damon O'Shea won't be available for teams who are still looking for management teams. So it's going to be intriguing. And I suppose with 
ratification is coming up now in a few weeks' time at uh, quite a few of the county board meetings. The shape of next year's championship should be fairly clear in the next few weeks. When, when people talked about the early conclusion to an inter-county season, they probably didn't factor into the a whole idea that there is going to be a full month of chat around managers and it's been a very, very exciting couple of weeks as well since the, the championships have finished and up. And as well, Owen, like we had three uh, finals on in club championships last week, which to me seems incredibly crazy. Like I realise that, you know, counties are going to run their championships as they feel is best for their county and clubs will vote ultimately on the structures within their counties as well. But I thought it was remarkable that you had actual club championships finishing up last week. And in some ways, maybe that's put a little bit of pressure onto some of the teams who are looking to get managements uh, in place. Because particularly if you're going for an external management, the fact that the campaigns have started a little bit earlier this time around means that realistically you have to have a manager in place to look at as much of your local championship as you possibly can. For sure. Uh, Will, Ashton, congratulations on your second place finish in this year's Quick Picks. Tommy is the winner. I finished last. And second last, of course, we should mention is... Uh, Adrian Barry and there's been plenty of comments coming in about his whereabouts Robert Lynch has been like has Adrian who's your daddy Barry been given the boot or what Greg Caffrey says you're all great but where is Adrian and Richard Redball says he's been crushed by a wheel of cheese which well, I, think I, is I assume he went from a direct celebration from the Talton Cup final for Westmead beat Cavan into Mullingar hosting the Fla and as a result Adrian Barry has just been you know enjoying the, probably the best month or so in Westmead's history and that's actually where he's been. Yeah, he is sandwiched between a massive wheel of cheese and a footpath in Mullingar <laughs> right now and we look forward to welcoming him back here to Friday's OTB AM next week. Chat to you then. I absolutely adore them lads. I have unbelievable time from but they're, they're a great bunch but it's not acceptable. It's five to nine. Now, Off the Ball is going back to Vicker Street in association with Cabri FC, and we've got a massive roadshow coming your way on August 17th. Michael Owen, Ian Wright, Emma Byrne, and Karen Carney are going to be amongst the guests, and there should be some great stories in the night as four legends of the game reminisce about their careers and talk about this season as well. This is an exclusive off air event, and tickets are limited, so don't delay. Go to otbsports.com forward slash events, and a reminder that ticket proceeds will go towards supporting Irish women's grassroots football. T's and C's apply. We shall see you on the night. Right, we are doing our top 10, sorry, we're doing Ashling's top 10 GEA moments of the summer because there is a heavy dollop of bias, which we'll get to in just a moment uh, over the course of these <laughs> top 10. But uh, you've been on the road, obviously, for off the ball over the last few months. Um, what inspired you to do this or, or what's uh, making up this list? What's informing the, the, the criteria for this? Yeah, so it's top 10 reporting moments for okay. myself. So just for, for people that are, are wondering, it mightn't be the best game of football or hurling or camogie that we've seen. Mm -hmm. It might be more personal to me in terms just of... the best mead the moments. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> did, you say, did you say mead moments? Mead moments, yeah. Oh, okay, no, 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 not at all. Uh, you'll see there's a surprise in there. Okay. Um, yeah, so maybe the best interviews, the best players that, that I got access to, managers, sort of all that type of thing as well as the, the games do feature in it too but um, yeah it won't be always on the, the best display or the best result it might be more behind the scenes of reporting Sounds good right we'll start at number 10 Yes number 10 are the Kilkenny the All-Ireland Senior Camogie Champions for me, I picked Kilkenny as number 10 because I feel that they have a great story this year. Um, they'd lost a lot of girls, almost rode off at the start of the year because they had lost so many of their experienced players due to travelling, um, injuries, retirements. And they went on and uh, won the All-Ireland. Um, they're a real likeable bunch. They like uh, their manager, Brian Dowling, such a passionate hurling camogie man. And, you know, he, he spoke to me a few times after the games and the way he speaks about the girls and that he was sitting up in the stands watching them lose All-Irelands. And, you know, he watched on and said, you know, actually, I want to go in there and I want to make a difference. And, yeah, it's it's just a really great story. And, yeah, they're, they're a brilliant team. Brilliant final against Cork. And yeah, they were number 10 on my list because I think they're very worthy champions. Absolutely. And that whole managerial ticket and some of the stuff they've had to go through this year as well has just been a brilliant element to, to that story as well. That Just to see them get over the line in the end and to see them um, get some joy at the end of a, a tough year for a lot of them was, was fantastic. So mm -hmm. that's number 10. Uh, number nine is an interesting one. Yeah, number nine is interviewing Porrick Joyce throughout the year. Um, for me, it, it's probably more of a personal one. He was definitely... If I had two people that I looked up to in football, it would have been him and Kerr McDonald from AO. So getting to interview Porrick Joyce was one of those moments as a reporter, which you're shaking. You know, you're going up with your mic shaking. I don't know if you've had these moments on, but 
definitely he he was one of them for me and I ended up telling him that uh, when I met him at the press event ahead of the All-Ireland final probably not meant to do these things as a reporter <laughs> <laughs> but I did and uh, yeah he's just been such a lovely lovely man to deal with and even at the press event you know he gives me so much time every time that I went to speak to him and even at the All-Ireland final I actually missed the chance to interview him after the game um, he just lost to Kerry you know a few questionable de- decisions as well in the game um, I'm sure you'll agree on mm. and uh, yeah so I'd missed the chance I was actually interviewing Jack at that time Jack O'Connor and he walked by and I thought oh no there's my chance gone and he went off into the dressing room to speak to the lads and I had spoke to, to Paul the PRO and he said oh yeah just hold on he, he'd went in and like he sort of met his family and friends you know in the the bar in Crow Park and he came back out and pulled me around the corner where it's quieter and was like no Brilliant. go ahead Ashley. Realize that. and I said G- such a such he doesn't a, have to do that he does like. not have to do that and he was with his family his young kids at the time I felt almost you know this is a very tough thing to do when you see a manager who's really hurt and after an All-Ireland final and yeah he gave me his time and we spoke for maybe five six minutes and yeah, he's just been so gracious all year and one of my highlights definitely yeah, yeah. of the year. And I'm sure everybody in, in Galway will be hoping that uh, they, he uh, gets ratified once again for next year. That seems to be one of the things that is left hanging out there at the moment, but I'm sure it'll be confirmed soon. Uh, number eight then. Number eight, are, yeah, Limerick are the All-Ireland champions. We're going to go back to that in a minute as a whole, but uh, this one in particular is about the, the Winners Hotel. So I went to the Winners Hotel the, the morning after the All-Ireland, which was Limerick, and um, was in the Burlington, I think it's the Clayton Hotel now in Dublin. Um, didn't know what to expect. I know it's something that Off The Ball have done um, many times, but I, I didn't know what to expect from it. And, the, you know, they said, we'll try get some of the team on air for half seven, eight o'clock. And I thought to myself, no chance who was going to be up at that time after winning All-Ireland and it was just a great buzz around the lobby in the hotel and a lot of the lads were about um, I know we got uh, Willow Donoghue Nicky Quaid Dermot Burns and Dan Morrissey were on the show uh, brilliant real likeable team I think this Limerick team um, really good with their time and then I spoke with John Kiley as well he's another manager him and Port Joyce would be my top two managers for, in terms of how nice they are with their time and I, I, I sort of take them back by it John Kiley like it's no surprise the Limerick team are so likeable uh, when they have a leader like him like he's such a, a, a great manager and he speaks about the players first and foremost about them as people and you know he talked to me about you know wanting to get them jobs and looking after them and all of that side of things and then we talk about the hurling and yeah he's just just a lovely man I spoke to him outside the, the hotel that morning and it's probably an interview that I really enjoy doing and you know I've watched back I don't like to sometimes watch back uh, some of the interviews I do um, but I really enjoyed listening to John because he, he's, he's mesmerised as he speaks about hurling and how he does it and what the players mean and yeah it was just meeting him and all the lads that morning was a, a great reporting moment Brilliant um, Number 7 then is one of the controversial moments of the summer Yes Brian Cody on the on the handshake with Henry Shefflin um, there was two handshakes this one in particular was the, the Leinster final when Kilkenny came out on top that day and we were all watching on would they shake hands would they not and they did in the end when Henry Shefflin uh, beelined over towards Brian Cody it didn't look like Brian was, was heading his direction at that point um, and I put it as my seventh moment because afterwards I asked him about it um, so I get a one-on-one with him um, if I'm lucky um, and it's just in like in the media area uh, behind say beside the dressing rooms and yeah I just managed to grab him and I just went for it and yeah sometimes as a reporter can be hard to ask those type of questions yes it's the job you have to do it some people were saying you know you know, leave it there you don't need to be asking those type of things Is you know talk about the game we had to ask so there was journalists saying that yeah, some journalists uh, some people on Twitter were calling me out you know saying you know talk about the game we're talking about this moment this shouldn't be what we're talking about like would you go away like <laughs> this is a massive moment I had to ask and he just said you know it's about the players and I don't want it to be all about me and he blew it off as if it, if it was nothing um, and I think Henry did similar uh, when he sort of was asked about it previously yeah. as well but uh, yeah that was my my seventh moment So six is the All-Ireland Hurling Final and five is the football final just a quick one here why did you pick the football over the hurling? Yeah, and I went back and forth and I sort of wrote out a list, to be honest, Owen, on why I was picking one over the other. And my reasoning was maybe because I thought that even though Kilkenny were never out of the game, they always looked like they could could 
not they couldn't go on and win it because I suppose that when I was sitting watching it, I did say to myself, they never looked like they were fully going to push on and beat Limerick. They, you know, it always looked like in my head, I felt like Limerick will push on here. Every time they got a goal or a score, it was always Limerick went up the up the field and did one better. So for me, watching at the, the football, I think just the scores were unbelievable. Um, Shane Walsh, unbelievable. Some of the best uh, scores we've probably ever seen in all Ireland final. So yeah, I think it was it was that for me. The atmosphere, the the tension going into the game. Got with Kilkenny and Limerick, there was a bit more that uh, Limerick on a walk this type of thing. But uh, yeah, it, it was back and forth. I I can't even say because the scores and the hurling were just as good too. But uh, for me, I think I was. I just, yeah, I just preferred the the football. I don't think I explained that well, but uh, yeah, it was it was a tough one. Yeah, Shane Walsh is the reason why. Yeah, the <laughs> no, 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 it. definitely not. No, um, no, no. There was many reasons, many reasons. Number four is a great one. Uh, number four. What is number four? It is. Oh yeah, Kerry's Louise Galvin. This was one of yeah my my moments of my the reporting this year for sure. And the way the interview came about is probably the most interesting bit. So uh, they played in the first semi final of the day. Mead were on after that against Donegal and it was Kerry against Mayo and I had to get back up to the press box to, to do the second game and I was rushing at that point um, I was to be on air so I knew I only had a certain amount of time and I was speaking with Declan the, the Kerry manager and he said you know that Louise was inside this was during an interview that she was inside and she was feeding the baby at that point her her son and I just thought to myself okay it'd be amazing I knew her story and I said it'd be amazing to be able to get an interview with Louise and yeah they said she'd be out in 10 minutes and then it was 20 minutes and I knew I had to get back up to get on air but I was like this story has to be worth it I know it would be it'd be amazing to do it and like I was on air with John and I was like I didn't want to let John down but I was like 20 minutes gone I was like oh no she's never coming out and then she came out with her little boy in her arms um, and it was it was amazing and she just spoke about how she was feeding him breastfeeding him in the changing rooms she wasn't sure if he was the, the first baby to be breastfed in Crow Park changing rooms and it was just a real moment I think for a lot of women in sport that we sort of all just went whoa this is possible like you know you can go on and have a family and you can still play at an elite level and there was so many people that shared it afterwards I got so much from it and how inspiring she was and you know I think many people will see a hell of a lot more of that now that it will be so normalised breastfeeding in general but as a, a woman to go on as a mother to be able to play at that level uh, 263,000 views on Twitter alone for that wow. show, so not bad uh, number three Number three is the Kerry versus Dublin All Ireland semi final. Um, so this actually trumped the the final. <laughs> what are you laughing at? On sound effects. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if they can hear these, but uh, yeah, something else going on there. Yours here. <laughs> uh, yeah. So number three was Kerry versus <laughs> Dublin, the All Ireland semi final. I was alongside Paddy Andrews and James O'Donoghue. I think the lads probably made it as well. Obviously, everything about the day, the lead up to it, there was no Conor Callahan. That was all the talk going into the game. And then we thought, okay, this is Kerry's for the taking for sure because they don't have Con, and that was not the case whatsoever. It went right down to the wire. Of course, we all know now at this stage, the forty-five meters out into a tricky wind into the hill. Sean O'Shea steps up at the the last kick of the game to put Kerry ahead and into the final and I think it, it was such a big moment for Kerry I felt there was going to be serious questions asked if Kerry if they couldn't get over that so much pressure and you could feel it and then for me personally just being there watching on alongside the lads like I remember when the team went behind the band and they were going around the field like the hairs on the back of your neck it felt like the, the final so yeah it, 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 felt, there, yeah, it? it felt like the All-Ireland final and I remember just looking to the lads and going like no one said anything we just all looked and was like whoa you know that sort of acknowledgement of geez, this is a serious atmosphere brilliant game and yeah yeah, yeah that was one of my moments of the year. Yeah, not a bad day out. The second in your list then is uh, Ulster yeah. final day. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Sound effect again. Um, yeah, second is the Ulster final day and I, I actually was back and forth of where I was going to put this but I had to think about it from my own like for a reporting point of view the access that I got that day and then just the day as a whole I think that everybody should experience an Ulster final. Have you ever been to one own? No, I have been to Clonus, but not for an Ulster final day. Yeah, Clonus, first off, amazing. Like the the buzz, everyone out around the bars, out around the street, the colour. Then you go down towards the, the stadium and 
just the colour from Derry. Obviously, first time in 24 years that they, they won the title. It was scenes. That is the only way of describing it. Absolute scenes. And it reminded me of years ago when you seen All-Ireland Finals in Crow Park and everybody was allowed on the pitch and you had invade the pitch and all the flags and all the colour. That was what it was like for, for this Ulster final. The game itself, I know a lot of people have different opinions on it. You know, a lot of people said it wasn't the best game of football and all of that. But for me being there, I was on the edge of my seat the whole way through. Went to extra time that day and it was just two points in the end that Derry got over the line. Um, Chrissy McKay lifting the cup was just iconic someone that has been there for so long with them um, and then for me then as a report and point of view and really why and another strong reason why I would have put it as my second today is because you know when they all all the players and management were all on the pitch afterwards all the fans we were allowed in with them in just like they put up barriers just around like say as they're going up to get the trophy and you got access to the players there right in the raw motion of it all and um, yeah Connor Glass spoke to me and he spoke about uh there was one man that was up there when he lifted the cup for the under 21s and that you know he was going to be a proud dairy man watching down them today and that was Martin McGuinness and I just thought that was a, a brilliant moment as well and yeah I think yeah that was why it's my, my number two Yeah they were definitely one of the stories of the football summer there appears to be a type on this list that uh, Sean O'Shea's kick isn't at number one but um, oh. well, what is what, what is the, uh, the the number one in your opinion? No typo <sighs> there uh, yes the, absolutely so it's me doing back to back All-Ireland senior titles it was incredible to see them do it I think obviously I'm from me uh, I'm maybe could be a little bit biased but I think a lot of people will agree that this is one of the best sporting stories that we will hear in, in GA I, I really do believe that men or women um, it's incredible what they have done they started out with this crop of players really coming together in 2017 uh, a few tough years they really regrouped and build on, built on their success and going from losing two intermediate All-Ireland finals to finally getting over the line, winning that intermediate final, then to push on and back it up at senior level and to win Division 3, Division 2, Division 1 as well is just incredible. Owen. It's been brilliant to watch and I think they've really put women's football on the map as well. Like I know it was in recent years we're hearing a hell of a lot more about it and you know that's brilliant to see but you know, there's people saying to me, no matter where I go and I say I'm from me, they say, geez, the women some are team. some team. Joy to watch. The type of football they play. You know, and of course I mentioned Emma Duggan, Vicky Wall, Emma Troy, like unbelievable players as well. So exciting. You don't know what they're going to do. You know, every game goes right to the wire and they put on their best performance in that All-Ireland final. They backed up why they were champions last year. It was absolutely no fluke. And I think it was something that the, the women's game really needed. Um, I think we talked about it maybe when they they won the first uh, senior title last year that, you know, the finals previous to that maybe hadn't reached the expectation that we wanted them to. And there was so many people tuned in, 50,000 people tuned in. And you're like, oh, you wanted that big final, your big performance. And I think in the last two finals, they've been unbelievable performances, really exciting. And yeah, Mead have been a massive story, not only because I'm from Mead, but I think just in sport as a whole, what they've done is so inspirational. No matter what you do, whether it's in sport or not, they'll inspire you. Yeah. yeah, for sure. It's been incredible. And just a, a level of emotion as well this year as well, which kind of uh, brought it to the level above. Great list, Ashling. Thanks very much. Not <laughs> bitter at all on. about Shawnee not being on top, but uh, I think you made a pretty good case for, for me there, to say the least. Uh, OTB AM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. On OTB Sports Radio today from half 11, we've got the football kickoff with Ger Cullum and David Connolly. Ronnie Delaney is OTB goal from one. Mount Rushmore is Cavan from three. Team 33 League of Ireland, Ireland legend Liam Coyle from four. And then Catherine Switzer is your OTB goal from six. You can follow off the ball across all our social channels, subscribe to YouTube, and be sure to download the OTB sports app as well. Now, ahead of our Cabri FC Roadshow on August 17th, we're going to be deciding on the top five most influential Irish players in both the men's and women's game. A reminder that tickets for the show in Vicar Street are on sale now and ticket proceeds will go towards supporting Irish women's grassroots football. See otbsports.com forward slash events for T's and C's and more. We shall see you on the night and after this break, it's time for the crappy quiz. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast? There is that residual hangover from the FA ban, from the lack of opportunities. My generation, I'm in my 40s now, we weren't allowed to kick a ball. I asked my PE teacher at my old girls' school, can we play football? And it was a flat no, so I had to buy myself a ball and practice keepy and teach myself. 
that was it until I went to university and made a beeline for the women's football team desk. Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts and download the OTB Sports app. Hi, this is Ian Wright and I've teamed up with Off the Ball and the Cabri FC for a very special night in Dublin this August. I'm going to be looking ahead to the new season, celebrating all that's great um, about the women's game alongside my former t- international teammate and dear friend Michael Owen and a couple of Arsenal legends in Karen Carney and Emma Byrne. Um, tickets for Vicar Street on August the 17th are on sale now with all ticket proceeds going to support women's grassroots football. So um, hopefully I'll see you there. Take it easy. If your business relies on a van, that wouldn't sound good. But this does. Get up to 75% off van insurance. Now available in FPD branches nationwide. FPD Insurance. Support. It's what we do. 75% no claims discount based on five years claims free. Available on new van policies. Used for farm or business purposes. Terms and conditions apply. Underwritten by FPD Insurance PLC. FPD Insurance Group Limited trading as FPD Insurance is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. OTB AM. With Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. Chris Martin. Oh, you're kidding me. September. Kyle Lafferty. Are you no! joking me? Is that right? I know. Is that right? Uh, anybody else? Leash, was it? Like, that is one of the most stupid questions. <laughs> Darius Vassell? Seriously, you only need to just stay quiet. This is getting really annoying doing this quiz. What is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> welcome, 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 welcome along to the shoutiest segments on Irish radio. It's the scintillating, it's the stupefying, it's the splendido crappy quiz. Every Friday, we pit three of team off the ball up against each other in our no holds barred quiz of sporting factoids at the end of the week. Allow me to welcome today's contestants. Our first contestant is OTB's resident Aston Villa fan and his viral rants this week have prompted YouTube commenters to say, finally, they're talking about someone that isn't Manchester United. Give it up for APM, angry producer Mick. One of my angrier moments. Uh, I, I feel like the, the moniker is unfair and outdated, but I suppose I lived up to it this week. Yeah, we, we'll be the judge of that, Mick. Don't worry. Have you found your newfound fame in Birmingham? <laughs> I haven't been to Birmingham since, but... Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. I was the voice of the voiceless this week. Let's face it. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so um, all those voiceless ranting Aston Villa fans on Twitter and TikTok and uh, Instagram and Facebook, and uh, they've no they've no platform look, whatsoever. Um, Mick, what happens if uh, if Aston Villa go on a six game winning streak here? Then I'm the happiest wrong man are in you, both Ireland and Birmingham. You, or do you look a little bit foolish? Is that is that I'm not I'm actually? I'm happy to look foolish. Is, I'm your, happy to look is foolish. your inner monologue Jared, not going? Uh oh, what happens if what happens <laughs> well, he turns around? Jerry, I see what you're doing here, but uh, I was about to say that I was the voice of the voice of saying something that nobody else had said, uh, except for you starting the O to AM on Monday morning with a very very similar rant. I was thinking, where do PM get their ideas from? <laughs> <laughs> by watching another of OTB shows obviously uh, our next contestant is shots fired <laughs> our next contestant is OTB's other resident Villa fan and his viral rants this week have prompted YouTube commenters to say please for the love of God this channel talks about Villa too much <laughs> give it up for the attire in Sher Gilroy hey more of that goodness coming next week after uh, Frank Lampard put Stephen Gerrard to the sword again uh, and our final contestant is OTB's resident space fan and his viral rants this week have prompted YouTube commenters to say finally someone who has the balls to call out the moon landings for what they were a complete fabrication give it up for Shane Hannan <laughs> morning lads how are things do you remember the time um, Owen you, you asked me if I had a photo of Neil Armstrong or do you think uh, Neil Armstrong would have a photo of him in, uh, in his room but um, <laughs> you, you then discovered that Neil Armstrong had uh, since left this mortal coil um, that was it was one of the great moments. Well, you, you made me bring it up, Owen. I'm sorry. It's worse than that. He's dead, Jim. Dead, Jim. Dead, Jim. It's worse than that. He's dead, Jim. <laughs> one of the great moments. It was, Good morning, uh, everyone. It was coronavirus-related brain fog, Shane, is what I'm putting it down to. <laughs> That's uh, fair. As ever, the format is the classic crappy quiz with a series of questions on a range of themes, and it's onto the slip and slide of trivia, which is the rapid fire round. You can podcast the crappy quiz on otbsports.com or on the OTB Sports app. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can click the thumbs up 
even if you contribute nothing but misery to your day, you can send any questions you have via postcard to Crappy Quiz Quizmaster, Off the Ball Towers, Marconi House, Diggs Lane, Dublin 2. And we did get post this week from Quap, Crappy Quiz regular, Crappy Quiz regular Garrett who you will know as the guy who often sends Roy the Rovers postcards hey. uh, in the post. So uh, he is back this week. Uh, round one is the boring questions round. Never multiple choice. These are from Has Garrett. he done the whole quiz? Uh, he's done two rounds. So you would no work to do whatsoever this week, Owen? Well, we've added another round, so it's basically the same <laughs> amount of work. Can we, get his, uh, can we get his postcards or one of them up on, the, on our set here? Well, or... he didn't send Roy the Rovers postcards this time. He wrote them out in A4 sheets of paper. Well, we don't, let's not put that up on the he set. Says he's, uh, although there was, uh, it, it was stamped from um, Port Leash Post Station, Post Office, and um, it was a Kelly Harrington uh, stamp which I hadn't seen before I don't really send letters so I don't really know wow the, the philately podcast brought to you by Owen Sheehan this is why they tune in Owen <laughs> <laughs> wow cutting let's just get to the questions question one for Mick <laughs> oh, one out. of those stamps you didn't even have to lick I'm wow not, I'm not comfortable being in seat one here they don't taste the same anymore um, I'm not getting high off this stamp at all Mick <laughs> there were four non-European or US golfers who finished in the top ten at this year's Masters can you name two of them Garrett actually said to name all four of them, uh, but I've. Uh, admitted, uh, I, I, he, you know when you're just like, like, like you Garrett. don't know where, what sport you're going to get. What I, I, I honestly have to say I don't remember a word you said about that question. So, but non-Europeans. So there were four non-European or US golfers who finished in the top ten at this year's Masters. Can you name two of them? Oh, non-European or US. Okay, I was going to go the complete other way there. Uh, The Masters feels like it was 20 years ago. I don't even know who won it. Oh, stop filling for time. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what, what other way to fill. Uh, I will say uh, Tony Fino and... Um, <laughs> and uh, American Tony Fino. Oh, is he not American? <laughs> is he not? He is. No, he's American. Oh, yeah. You said non-American. Non-American, oh. non-European. Uh, no, I just, for some reason I just could not grasp that question. <laughs> um, famous Australian Cameron Smith is one of them. Oh, yeah. uh, Corey Connors, Sung J M, and Charles Schwartzel were the Shout four out. options. Jer, which Republic of Ireland international was <laughs> named on the PFA Top Flight Team of the Season in eighty eight, eighty nine, nineteen ninety one, and ninety one, ninety two? Paul McGrath. No. Ooh. What's the question? Andy Townsend. Oh bollocks. Uh, the Ireland international who was named in the PFA top flight of the wow, season. I wouldn't have got him. I would, have, I would have more predicted. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I would have guessed Paul McGrath as well. Well, I or or how? Norwich years was it? Actually. Yeah, Norwich and uh, Hampton? Chelsea. Chelsea. Shane, in only one year this century, did the All Ireland Football Runners Up fail to get more than one All Star award? What is the year in question? The runners up. Who would be the worst runners up we've had? In what, what time frame? This Ever. century. All oh, right. This okay. century. Yeah. So they've all got two or more all stars for their troubles, except for one year. I'm gonna go. Nah. Me though one. No, no. It was at Cork and 07. Cork 07. Oh, Mick actually knew it. Ah. Uh, Graham Canty was their sole recipient. Was <laughs> Round two. How many did Tyrone get there that Dublin beat them after the first kick out? They must have got two, maybe three. Paul Cavanagh definitely got one, I think, Ronan McNamee. Did they? Both, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Round two is the reeling in the years round. In this round, I give you all a year, and all you got to do is name the winners and runners-up of three sporting competitions from that year. This is the cheap television that will always be repeated in the summer round. <laughs> uh, Mick, your year is 2012. Can you give me Ooh. the champions and runners-up of the Ulster Football Championship, the Leinster Hurling Championship, and men's soccer at the Olympic Games. This is a very hard question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for, fair, no. thanks for saying that because I'm there going, I don't know any of these. What am I going to do? <laughs> I'm like, hang on a second. <laughs> ha, 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 ha. But now I'm just intimidated. Okay. Uh, Ulster, Donegal. Yeah. Won it, did they? Did it. Uh, and beat Monaghan? No, they beat Down. Leinster Hurling Championship. Uh, Galway beat Kilkenny yes there you just go just came to be Jesus and then men's soccer at the Olympic Games so this was the Great Britain team I don't think they made a final though maybe they did uh, anyone, anyone you want to nod or shake your head there I mean I don't know did they even qualify he's too experienced, he's too experienced for this the home uh, team qualify automatically 
Go, go, go with your gut there. If Great Britain is, if your gut's telling you. I'm going to say that Argentina beat Great Britain. They didn't. It was Mexico who beat Brazil in that final. I was going with Brazil. Yeah. Jerry, your question is based on last year, 2021. Can you name the champions and runners up of the under 20 hurling All Ireland? Oh, for fuck's sake. The Camogie Senior All Ireland and the <laughs> EFL Championship. <laughs> Sorry. We apologise to all our sensitive ears out there. Sorry, under 20, what? Hurling or football? Hurling All Ireland. The Camogie Senior All Ireland and the EFL Championship. What year is this? The EFL 2021. Championship. So there's only yeah, one winner? The Championship. Uh, no, there's a second place team in. First and second. So the winners uh, of the. The championship in 2021. So the under 20 hurling champions yeah. were Cork. They were. Could a Cork beat in the oh, final? This could be a trick question. The Camogie uh, was uh, Galway beat. Yeah. Did they beat Cork or Kilkenny in the final? Did Cork lose back to back? I'm going to go Kilkenny. No, they beat Cork. The EFL champions. Um. So, the previous, uh, this year it was Fulham and Bournemouth and the previous year it would have been, uh, so who just came up? Everybody stayed up, did they? Tick tock. Gonna go. Push you for an answer here. Um, I'm gonna go, uh, bur, bur, the other bur, bur, what are they? <laughs> <laughs> can't do that. That's unfair. That is unfair. So, um, in the under-20 <laughs> hurling final... So the answer's not Burr. Cork beat Tip... Burr never didn't qualify for the did, Premier League. Did Cork beat Tipperary in the final? Uh, no, they beat Galway. So that's gone. So I need two teams for the championship. Didn't they also beat Dublin a week later? Uh, did they? That, that was in the 2020 final. Oh, yes, yes. I but, forgot about that. So that's why the uh, uh, Two teams question. in the championship. Uh, I'm going to go with... Um, Go on, name two football teams, Jer, for God's sake. Come on. Uh, Bournemouth. No. Bournemouth, who are in the Premier League now. And. Norwich. No, I can't give you that. Norwich Ridge came first. Watford. Watford I, didn't came say, I didn't say which was which. I know, but I have to accept. If no, you were, come on, if you I got Norwich. Gonna... I got one of them. You've got to give me a point for Norwich. You have to put them in order. Oh, you got to put them in order. That's the whole point. That's the whole point. You didn't. Well, I didn't say which order they were in. Yeah, uh, well. Uh, Shane, your year is 2000. Can you name the winners and runners-up of the World Snooker Championship, the Formula One Drivers Championship, and Euro 2000? Ah, here. But it's a long time. It's 22 yeah, years but that's ago. That's easier. It's 22 years ago. Yes, though, so. that is easier. <laughs> My like, lads, I was seven years old. Come on. Yeah, yeah but that exactly, oh, exactly oh, the time when you start pouring over books. That's exactly what I know yeah. things. Yeah. Maybe he couldn't read until he was eight. <laughs> <laughs> the 2000 World Snooker Champion. All is. Hey, you've asked some snooker in Formula subject. One. Special you know, subject, asked him who's the first man on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> um, Still knocking around. <laughs> Jesus, Bruce. Ronnie's first was a one. Who's the second um, man? I mean, you'd have to include him in this as well. Oh, he knows him. <laughs> yeah, he was, was. He was shot in Bill Nablaw, wasn't he? That was the third guy. Buzz Lightyear, wasn't it? <laughs> no, yeah, yes. <laughs> you, Mark Williams, the snooker champion. He was. And you want to be beaten the final? I'm guessing. Mark Williams, who just won it recently. <laughs> That's the worst filler ever, Shane. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a second. Right, uh, so I'd say he beat in the final in 2000. Oh, who would he have beaten in the final? Um, Tony Virgil. Tony was it, Drago. Was it uh, Matthew Stevens? It was. Wow. Wow, you really know your snooker. A well uh, hit that one. What? Uh, anything else Stop from here as a bonus? Uh, Euro 2000. You said Euro 2000, oh, yeah. 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 Oh, that's so easy. France beat... Yeah. Italy. Yeah. That's oh, come ridiculous. on. It's a Euros final though. With yeah. like a with a silver goal. He takes the lead. Guys, he's got four F1. points, so you're at the F one. Who won for me? Easiest of them all. Um if in doubt, say Michael Schumacher. Michael Schumacher. Wow. That's a good answer. Yeah. Really uh, impressive. And you want who came second? Oh. You've asked him Michael Schumacher and peak. Thierry Henry. Michael Schumacher, who won in 2000, which he was the first of his five in a row. So it's like the... Grumpy old man in studio today. Come on. Um, who will have come second to Schumacher? That was he watches football at the Olympics and he was as Euro 2000. Uh, <laughs> but that was like only 10 years ago. Eddie Irvine? No, it wasn't uh, Eddie Irvine. 
It was Mika Hakkinen. Ah, of course. Uh, so, uh, Shane, congratulations. You've moved two into the lead after that. Uh, stunning display. You're on five points. Mick is on three points. Jura's on two points. As we move into round three, which is the Pass the Parcel of Doom round. In this round, all you got to do is give me a name that's on a list of names. And then the Parcel of Doom passes on to the next contestant, who then also has to give me a name. We will keep moving through the list until one of you gives me an incorrect answer, at which point that person will be eliminated. And the last person standing gets the point. These questions were also sent in by Garrett, so thank you to Garrett. Mick. Can you name a FIFA World Cup runner-up? Germany. Correct. It goes to Ger next. Uh, the Netherlands. Correct. Um, Sweden. Yeah. Oh, sorry, me. Uh, uh, Italy. Italy is correct. Oh. Yeah. Jesus. It's going to be there for a second. Croatia. Bro. Yes. Uh, me next, uh, France. Yeah. Brazil. Yeah. Uh, Uruguay. No. Perfect record in finals. You're out. Shane. Um, Chile. No, you're out. Mick gets the point. Argentina. Argentina was the obvious one that was missing. Uh, Czechoslovakia and <laughs> Hungary were the other two. Jer, can you name an AFL team? I mean, no. All right. Uh, Hawthorne. Correct. We don't have to go with the full names, no? What's the full Hawthorne name? Hawthorne Football Club? Hawks. I mean, oh, that's... Uh, no, no, I, oh, I think Hawthorne is fine. They're probably uh, no, called No, 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 we're not going with full names. I don't have yeah. full names in front of me. Okay. I mean, that is just a little bit showy for Mick. I think he should be deducted a point for... Like, Who's next? For Who's next? Uh, sorry, it's Shane next. <laughs> oh, um, Geelong. Yeah, correct. <laughs> <laughs> Collingwood. Collingwood, yeah. Magpies. What's me next, sorry? Oh, it's Jer. Jer, yeah. Canberra? No, Canberra does not exist. <laughs> In the uh, sphere, at least, as he spills his coffee everywhere. Mick. Oh my god. Uh, the West Chain. Sorry. Sorry. Me <laughs> uh, Sydney Swans. Yeah. Uh, the Western Bulldogs. Yeah, that's correct. We're doing well here now. Um, Adelaide Crows. Yeah. Port Adelaide. Yes, correct. <laughs> Mick knows his uh, AFL teams by the sounds of things. Did he, did he never tell you he stayed spent some time in Australia? This is, a, this is unfair say, round. I've told on that, actually, no. It's, you're the eggs. only person in the world who hasn't heard that story. <laughs> <laughs> when people God. go travelling, they turn into travel bores, Owen. What just a, just to let you know this. Uh, when people uh, go travelling, they turn into travel bores. <laughs> hey, uh, Carlton. Carlton is correct. Good. Mick. Um, Essendon. Essendon is correct. The Bombers. He did forgot the Bombers. <laughs> <laughs> Even I know that one. Um, Fremont. I can't accept that. Fremantle. It's Fremantle. Sorry, Fremantle. I just came from Las Vegas, lads. Fremont ah, Street see. on the brain. Just got two travel bores on uh, the crappy quiz today. <laughs> what <have> I said? <laughs> <laughs> the ones that we were missing. Most last thing I ever said. Uh, Brisbane Lions, uh, Fremantle, Gold Coast Suns. Greater Western Sydney Giants, Melbourne, North Melbourne, Richmond, St Kilda, and West Coast Eagles. Oh, St Kilda. Shane, can you name a winner of the RTE Sports Person of the Year Award this century? Katie Taylor. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, it goes to Mick next. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Kelly Harrington. No. Uh, no, she's never won it. Why did she win it? Sonia O'Sullivan. Sonia O'Sullivan is correct. Why did Kelly Harrington not win? Who won yeah, that year? Golden year Tell, for me Irish sport, Tell me when it comes up. Tell me when it comes up. Shane. Oh, he's frozen. So Shane's actually frozen. <laughs> okay, Jerry gets the point. That's it. If you don't come back in five seconds, Shane, I get Shane, back in for Shane? Five, no. Four. I him. You've had a wrong answer. Three. But I'll represent Shane. No. Two. One. You're done. 
Excellent. Shane Hannon <laughs> has gone. Right. Oh, he's got the, I'll, Look at him. I'll take all his points. Uh, Jer gets a point. So it's 5-5-3. Five, five, <laughs> <Sorry, laughs> all of them. As we enter into round four, which is... We should do some more of those. You should just give some of the answers to Oh, the, sorry. The answers to the uh, question. I would have said Derville O'Rourke. Derville O'Rourke. And you would have been out. All right. Very good. <laughs> uh, Shane uh, is back. Trapatoni. Uh, back here, lads. Uh, before, are we going to do this? Didn't the hockey team? Yeah, Graham, we'll continue. Uh, Shane, give us a... No! Uh, give us, <laughs> no! Give us a sports person of the year oh, there, Shane. I've already got a wrong no. one. No. What did I miss? You just only missed Katie Taylor, Taylor and then someone said uh, Kelly Harrington. That's, yeah, that's that was wrong. I got. Sonia yeah. Sullivan is correct. You, you were next. Go. Come on. Uh, Padraig Harrington? Yeah, correct. Sure, we'll give you another chance there. Shane Lowry? Yeah. You're gone again, are you? Come I'm on. Out. No, Fine. no, I got it. Oh, it's me. Uh, Robbie Keane. <laughs> There's only two of you left. Sorry. Uh, Robbie Keane never got it. So Jerry gets the point anyway. The remaining ones Conor were, McGregor? Glad we went back to that. Conor McGregor would have got it. Yeah, <laughs> that was worthwhile. Uh, Rachel Blackmore, Michael Conlon, Barry Geraghty, Mick McCarthy, James McLean, Tony Mick McCarthy. McCarthy. <laughs> Mick McCarthy. Lads, like, take the licence fee away for that. Graham McDowell, Conor McGregor, Why Rory McIlroy. Why did Mick McCarthy get it? Oh, Blackmore won it at the Olympic in no the two. Ha- Harrington year. Yeah, 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 Brian O'Driscoll, Ronan O'Gara, Sean O'Gohalpine, Johnny Sexton and Henry Shefflin were the remaining names. Uh, round four is the shirt numbers round. Another scores, new and innovative idea from producer Cullum. He wants me in this round to ask you questions about numbers in football shirts and things like that. You're Mick, very, very committed to this round, uh, Question four for you. LeBron James is known for wearing the number 23 jersey and what other number currently his number for the Los Angeles Lakers? Oh, well, he did wear another... I, I don't know if this is the same answer, but he won titles with Miami wearing number six. Is that your I answer? I don't. Well, I don't know if that's his current number for the Lakers or not. But you're saying he's associated with two numbers. Yeah, yeah, he is. Six. Six is correct. Yeah. That's just you kind of coached the witness there. Um, I know. We, I you got, nodded your head straight away. Went, well, yeah, that's it, Mick. Give me number six yeah. jersey just got retired by the NBA for Bill Russell. So does the, does LeBron get the key? Oh yeah, it? Good, good point actually. I don't know, maybe it's a legacy. He gets to wear it until retired. It can be grandfathered out. Uh, Jer, what number jersey was Peter Canavan wearing when he scored that goal against Kerry in the 2005 All Ireland? Kind of started and came off, but was he named? I don't know if he was named in the team or not. 17. No. 13. <laughs> uh, Shane, uh, Bruno Fernandes has ditched the number 18 jersey for Manchester United this season in favour of which number? Another specialist subject round for Shane. <laughs> um... Juan Mata left, which would have opened number eight. Correct. There's a lot of bitterness in the studio towards Shane's Bloody success hell. here in the quiz so far. It is uh, Shane six, mix six, Jer three. As we enter round five, which is the fun free magic number round, contestants get uh, three points for getting the number exactly right. If no one manages that, the nearest contestant who doesn't go bust gets two points. The second closest gets one point. <laughs> <laughs> is that, that's not, uh, I'm going to say you can only accept the answer that's written on your paper. <laughs> I'm, all, I'm also, I don't know why I'm laughing. I'm also going to, have to ask for your pens once the music ends. <laughs> it's, it's just a level of disappointment here in the studio. Uh, if you don't mind, give us the following number: the number in the men's world rugby rankings that New Zealand currently occupies, plus the number of Wimbledon singles titles won by Serena Williams. Plus the number of times Cork have now won the senior Camogie All Ireland, plus the number of times Real Madrid have now won the Super Cup. You say seconds. Cork have now won. Yeah, absolutely. same as they had last week. Yeah, what was the last question? Real Madrid. They what? did not win last week. That's a good point. Uh, Real Madrid. How many times have they won the Super Cup? Uh, your thirty seconds expire when Snatcher sings "Bright Shiny Beads." So, what position in the men's world rankings are the All Blacks? How many singles titles did Serena Williams win at Wimbledon? How many times have Cork won the Camogie All Ireland? And how many times have Real Madrid won the Super Cup? I have to be honest and say I don't know the answer to three of them. Shane, we'll go to you first. What have you got? Uh, 45. 45, Jer? 45. 45. Mick? 42. The answer is 45. Wow. Three points each. Three points each. So uh, Shane's Shane is up three for a three-point three gap at the top. So uh, New Zealand, fifth in the world. Yeah. yeah. Serena, seven Wimbledon titles. Yeah. 
Cork, 28 Camogie titles. Okay, that's where I went wrong. Real Madrid, five Super Cup titles. So oh. Shane is on nine points, Jer is on six points, Mick is on six points. One of the highest scoring well, quizzes we've ever had. Can we ask the lads honestly, did you stumble on 45 or did you get all the questions right? Oh no, I completely stumbled on it. Okay. Well, I got, I the, got, the, I got yeah, the 28 helped. I got the 28 and then roundabout way got the, got the rest. I had 27 for that, but... Um, that's pretty good. I only had 20, so that's where I went wrong. Our winner tonight will be decided in the no theme of particular ridiculously easy rapid fire round. So the score you get in this round will be added to your score from the previous rounds. There will be 40 seconds for everyone to answer from the same set of questions. We're going to start with Shane, then move on to Stupid Mick, real. because we tossed a coin earlier Stupid and real. Mick won the, to- the coin toss. The person who's last should go first to make a bit of jeopardy in the quiz, because otherwise he just comes on and answers all the questions and the quiz is over. It's a, it's a limp ending. So, should all get round. so the order is Shane, Mick, Jar. But Shane, by all means, if you want to relinquish uh, your lead for the sake of entertainment, you can. Don't know, don't know if we should change the rules now, lads. I think it's been a it's been a something that's gone on for years. It would be like changing yes. something that's a part of us, a part of our culture. Yeah, it'd be like introducing the forward mark. Yeah, terrible, terrible idea. We'll change it in a few weeks. Shane, are you ready? Ready to go. Your forty seconds starts now. Name the new Kilkenny hurling manager. Derek Ling. Correct. And what year did Serena Williams last win a Grand Slam? Twenty seventeen. Correct. What nationality is Lissandra Martinez? Argentinian. Correct. Name the same Pats manager. Um, Keith Long. No, Tim Clancy. In golf, where did this year's US Open take place, Mick? Uh, Portrush. Brookline. <laughs> Which club has Diane Caldwell joined this week, Chair? Birmingham. Reading. Matthew Stafford is the quarterback of which NFL team, Shane? The Washington. No, Rams. Which of these clubs has Harrington to Hag managed? Twente or Utrecht, Mick? Doesn't matter. Manchester United. I, I you can second. you can uh, hear the joy in the studio here, Shane. They are all very very happy for your <laughs> success. You, we're proud of you, buddy. Well done on the easy questions that were somehow set up. Formula for you. One, two Manchester Man United, United questions. Yeah, snooker. Side, uh, snooker. Yeah, it's all true though. How does it feel, Shane? <laughs> <laughs> it's all true. How does it feel? That's, empty. It, that's bacon. one. That's one small quiz win for me. One giant leap in. Um, Knowledge, sporting knowledge. <laughs> well done, you really got there in the end. <laughs> you were like, nearly amazing. <laughs> I mean, just, you had to go Monaghan. That was it. You would have got away with that. We would have been like, yeah, yeah, stumble, uh, stumble like that. We should, we should but, get uh, Neil Armstrong in the studio. We should. Yeah. Uh, mm. Congratulations, Shane. Uh, on <laughs> on a great quiz win, twenty um, quid in the medium and sort that out. Yeah, <laughs> um, no, I'm delighted for you, Shane. Well done, delighted that uh, delighted, none of these two delighted. chumps ended up winning. So that is this week's uh, crappy quiz. OTBAM has been brought to you live each morning this week by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. We're back on Monday from half seven with reaction to the weekend sport. Right now, we're leaving you with Ed McGreal of the Mayo News, who joined uh, Nathan Murphy on last night's off the ball to examine the managers in contention to succeed James Horn. Have a great weekend. Now, though, we're going to turn our attention to a much more sane county when it comes to managerial appointments. Uh, Mayo on the lookout for a new manager after James Horan stepped away following their All-Ireland defeat uh, to Kerry earlier in the year. There are four candidates to replace James Horan. Kevin McStay, Mike Solon, Ray Dempsey and Declan Shaw. And all four have put together star-studded backroom teams. So it's going to be fascinating to see what develops over the next few weeks. The Mayo GEA committee has been appointed. It features the chairman, Seamus Toohey, the treasurer, Valerie Murphy, the assistant secretary, Ronan Caron, and the South Mayo County Board Chairman, Mike King. Sean Silk, who's a human resources manager and won an All-Ireland Senior Hurling Medal with Galway. And Pat O'Donnell, a former managing director of Allegan Pharmaceuticals and also current member of the Corgia Mayo Fundraising Committee. Uh, the Mayo GEA Secretary Dermot Butler not involved in the committee owing to a conflict of interest. Uh, both Stephen Rochford and Damian Mulligan, clubmates of him, Butler said to the Mayo News yesterday, of course there's pressure to get things right this time and at the end of the day I believe up we'll end up with the very best candidate. It's important that we get it right and that we're seen to do the right thing. Uh, the Mayo News also reporting yesterday that a former Mayo footballer is expected to be added to this committee over the coming days to chat about what will happen next and what has gone before. Ed McGreal of the Mayo News is with us. Evening, Ed. Evening, Nathan. How are things? 
I am all right. So Philly McMahon said in his Irish Independent column last week, the process around the Mayo job has become a bit of a circus over the last couple of weeks. In most counties, you might only get rumours about the identities of the candidates just before ratification or as an official announcement. Not only does everyone know who's in the frame of Mayo, their entire backroom teams are public knowledge and one of the candidates is doing in-depth interviews with the local paper outlining his case. It's like electing a GEA president or the Rose of Trilly. That fair? Yeah, what you see, far, far, far from me, um, far be it for me to disagree with uh, Philly McMahon, but it's 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 an interesting perspective, and it's certainly one that has uh, got a lot of currency of late. Because, and I think one of the main reasons for it is it has been dragging quite a bit. But I just think, from an overall point of view, if you look at the history of Mayo appointments, and uh, I wrote about this a few weeks ago in the Mayo News, it has been inglorious there has been so many inglorious episodes in the last 30 years or so um so i think that's something that you have to factor into it and the other thing as well some counties do their like we see we saw kilkenny um did their business so swiftly after brian cody's resignation Derek ling is in there um i think you have to bear in mind the level of trust in the kilkenny county board would be a lot higher than the level of trust in the mayo county board and i think that's a factor um and as well as that, I just think it's um, uh, if you look back to this time last year, uh, Curry went down a similar road where they had appointments, uh, they in- invited applications uh, when they didn't renew Peter Keane's uh, position. Mm. Uh, Jack O'Connor's uh, did an interview, uh, and Paddy Talley's uh, name was 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 known in advance of those interviews. Um, the Stephen Stack team was uh, was was. was revealed in advance as well a star stood a team that was was overlooked and you know Kerry can say it worked out very well for them and they're all Ireland champions now so yeah I I I think um I, I think some of this is because it's Mayo people say it's going to be it, it, it's becoming a circus but I, I I just think when you go down this process of inviting submissions of course guys are going to uh consider letting it be known what their backroom team are and three of them have publicly um have, have confirmed them effectively and ray dempsey hasn't confirmed his but there's there's a lot of talk um about who's involved in his backroom team so that creates that creates its own uh, its own level of interest and of course like i say the length of time is the key and this is where there will be distinction with Kerry. Kerry had their business wrapped up in less than a month mm. from when they said that peter Keane Keen wasn't going to be renewed Jack O'Connor was announced as ma- that was at the start of September before the month was out. Jack O'Connor was a new Kerry manager. James Horan uh, stepped away six weeks ago on Monday, and Mayo still haven't had the interviews, let alone appointed the manager um, to replace him. So you're looking at it uh, at realistically, uh, it could be over two months. Um, so that's that's, I suppose, where you can absolutely see a lot of criticism for what has been happening uh, and it's it's very fair comment because yeah it, it, it could be run a lot quicker than it has been uh, and, and I guess I the county board work. would say listen if they get the right person it's worth that weight uh, even though the you know Mayo Club Championship getting underway you want that manager to be there making assessments on new players we're probably lucky to get you Ed because it does seem as though the Mayo News phone line has been hopping uh, with all sorts of people wanting to talk to the Mayo News so Dermot Butler the Mayo GA secretary uh, in response to well, Philly McMahon, I assume, said there are social media hacks out there calling the whole thing a circus, but they know nothing about what they're talking about and aren't taken seriously by anyone with a real involvement in sport. No matter what we do, we'll have these so-called scholars on social media criticising us, but they just make me laugh. They think they know what they're talking about. They think they have an inside track on what's happening, but they don't. The term circus if it's thrown out there, it's because of what has gone before around Mayo. You speak about the last 30 years, Absolutely. but talk a bit more about more modern times, maybe going back to James Horan's appointment first time around after John O'Mahony lost the job, and then what's gone on in the three or four times between them and Mayo have had to appoint a new manager. The, the people do feel at times it becomes a bit of a circus. Yeah, and absolutely. Like tr- Trust is earned, and the, the county board in Mayo have to earn that trust. And uh, you know they have to earn it in this process and they'll have to earn it the next time and the next time and the next time again because they've there there's a lot of water under the bridge um on this and you mentioned james horn's first first term in 2010 like uh tommy lines was the favorite of the um the top table effectively of the county board at the time even though from what we can gather he wasn't the recommendation of the interview 
um, the interview subcommittee, uh, they, they, they lean towards James Horan, but uh, it was only when there was a bit of a pushback within the county at news that Tommy Lyons seemed set to get the job um, that there was a U-turn and uh, that James Horan ended up getting the job. Um, and then James Horan did, did four years after losing in Longford. Mayo were in four consecutive All-Ireland semi-finals and two All-Ireland finals. And then he stepped down after losing to Kerry in Limerick in 2014. And then Kevin McStay um, applied for the, uh, put, put his name forward and for, for w- w- was spoken to, I gather, by the county board. Um, it interviewed informally. There was nobody else on, uh, forward for the position at that stage. Um, but before the close of applications, I think the Noel Kennelly and Pat Holmes went in as a as a joint ticket, and um, um, and Ke- Ke- Kevin Max Day was uh, was told effectively that uh, would would he would he continue with an interview process, but he wasn't the preferred choice of the top table. Um, and needless to say, that didn't play out very well. And uh, that um, the following year, then of course there was the infamous heave against um, the management of uh, Pat Holmes and Noel Kennelly when the players voted. Uh, voted, uh, I, I think, a three quarters majority um, to uh, a, of, of no confidence effectively in the management, and uh, um, and that was an inglorious episode as well uh, for for a number of reasons. Stephen Rochford took over, managed Mayo for three years, got them to two All Ireland finals, um, and he went in twenty eighteen. In you know, it, it wasn't very well handled either. It was far from straightforward. And James Horan, James Horan came back in in 2019, um, and that was far from straightforward uh, at the time as well. He ended up uh, putting his name forward, not being nominated by his club and a couple of other clubs, I believe, um, and ended up getting get, getting the job. But um, those questions over whether he was the preferred choice um, for a number of uh, a number of the top table as well. So it it had been, it has been. Um, like I say, an inglorious uh, saga, this whole appointment of Mayo managers in terms of how people have been appointed and in terms of how they've been removed or how um, things have finished mm. up. Yet ironically, uh, they've almost always ended up with the right man. Um, yeah, well, I suppose... Yeah, or certainly someone who went on to become a success with the exception of, of Holmes and Canelli from the players' point of view. Yeah, and, and and look at and people would, would, would people would say back to that that they all lost an All Ireland semi final after a replay uh, under their management as well. So there's, there's um, yeah, there's a lot of different ways of looking at it. But no, effectively in a lot of cases they have. But um, sometimes the feeling would be it would be in spite of themselves rather than because of themselves. And that's why I think this process that they have underwent now, where um, people have to nominate, there's a subcommittee which is uh, set to have four people from the county board, three outside people, and there's a very uh, structured interview process to ensure effectively transparency and fairness, uh, transparency for everyone and fairness for those um, people, four people in, in this particular case that have put their name forward and put their heads on the block, um, that they all be treated with the respect that they deserve for having the, having the, having the bravery and the gumption to, to, to go for this job. So, um, so I, I think the process in the process as a consequence will take a certain length of time, but it could, it could be further down the road. Um, than now, for mm. instance, it wasn't until, um, two weeks after James Horn, uh, stepped down that, uh, Mayo started the process of seeking, a um, seeking a replacement because they wanted to wait until the All Ireland minor final was out, was out of sight. Um and and that's straight away, that's that's a delay at the start. And the close line, the closing date for um uh for applications was Friday, July 29th at 6 p.m. And it wasn't until the following Tuesday that the county board met to talk about setting up a subcommittee. Um, and I just feel they could have done that much sooner as well. Um, and to, to, to defend the county board there, uh, and you know, obviously there have been issues previously, by delaying and by, by not rushing in, as you say, it does give an element of transparency to this, that everybody knows the four people going for it, everybody knows their backroom teams. And while the vacuum that's been left over the past few weeks does in Mayo uh, lead to a hell of a lot of noise and rumour and speculation, that they didn't just jump the gun here, they didn't appoint a, a favoured person two weeks afterwards. Actually, they're being slow, they've been methodical, they're thinking about this. Am I giving them too much credit? <laughs> no, 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 look, and I, 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 you mentioned the club championship. The club championship doesn't start until September, so they are hoping to have this uh, process closed by the end of August. Um, 
But I do think within the parameters of the structure here, which um, I think allows uh, fairness and, and transparency, I do think that they could have been a little bit more efficient than looking at a, an overall at a two-month window. Um, but like you say, none of that will matter really if uh, people feel by the end of this process um, that by and large that it has been fair and it has been transparent and that there's a general feeling that they have, um, you know, that a strong candidate has come through uh, and has gotten uh, has gotten the position. Mm. There's no doubt about it with four people in this race and, and four... Um, like the, the the quality of of, um, of candidates and backroom teams have surprised a lot of people, myself included. Um, that was the level of interest because there was concerns in advance that um, get, getting a strong management team mightn't be simple, and that isn't the case anymore. Um, so the county board find themselves in a, in in a, in, a, in a good position. Um, but obviously, there, there's going to be three three sets of uh, management teams that will be very disappointed, and there will be people who would support them and feel that they are the best people for the job. So there won't be, you know, you know, um, universal support mm. for whoever gets over the line. Um, but if there is a sense that it has been carried out the proper way and that everyone feels that they got a fair crack at it, um, it will make it, it, it will make it a bit easier. But you know, as well as I do, Nathan, like whoever gets the job, um, they're not going to be off the hook. There's only going to be, there's only one talk, uh, whoever gets this job. Um, there's only one. Potter, that people said, only got one thing about. in mind. Mm. Unfortunately, that's well. Fortunately, maybe, but uh, that's the, at this stage. That's uh, what what the Mayo Senior Football Team yeah. and their manager will be judged on is uh, is can they get the big canister in? I was going to say September, in July or August, whenever whenever it will, will be next year, um, or, or or the year after, for, for that matter. Um, that's the, that's the long and the short of it. The most interesting name and the one that came out of the blue was Kevin McStay throwing his hat back in the ring again and then putting together a backroom team of Stephen Rochford who's come closer than anybody to getting Mayo to that holy grail. Uh, Donny Buckley, who's got a brilliant reputation as a coach. Damian Mulligan, who's well-known in local circles. And Lee McHale, who was, you know, one of Mayo's greatest ever players and a key part of the last time Max Day went. We might go back to 2014 and the fiasco that developed around that appointment of Holmes and Kennelly and Max Day and McHale missing out. And I remember being here and off the ball on that Saturday when we were talking about the upcoming interviews and getting word that actually a decision has already been made and that Mikhail and McStay have been told they're probably not getting this. And then the following Tuesday night when they thought they were going to be actually doing their official interview, uh, Lee McHale actually ended up on this show talking to Joe about the fact that it was already a done deal and that they knew they weren't getting the gig. Here's what he had to say. Liam, with this situation, with this, with, 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 with what's happened here, put you, I know you can't speak for Kevin, but would it put you guys off running again? Um, I would imagine, I would imagine, um, you know, uh, we felt that our, the, the time was right now for, for us to go for, for, for the job, you know, with our, with, with the way, with, with, with the, with our ages now and with, uh, with the way we are in the game at the moment. And we felt that the team was, uh, good enough, uh, uh to win in All-Ireland. So I, I don't know, I can't speak for Kevin, but I, yeah. I, I, the biggest disappointment for me is not that, we didn't get the job this time, but the biggest disappointment for me, Joe, is I'd probably never uh, be involved in, with me all again as coach or selector or whatever, you know, and obviously my dream from 18 years of age to now was to win an All-Ireland with me all. I, I, I failed to do it as a player, so I was always hoping one day that I might be able to do it as a coach or as a manager or a selector or whatever, and I feel for, for me now that that day is, is done, that uh, I'll, never be, I'll never be involved with me all football again, you know. Ed, there was a lot of raw emotion that night from Lee McHale and Kevin McStay was on this show a couple of years ago with Joe and talking about it again and how he felt you know, his time as an inter-county manager was done and he would never take charge of Mayo. What's your understanding of what's changed that McStay and McHale are willing to put themselves out there again? Yeah, well, I suppose yeah. When when Lee McHale was speaking there, like like you said, there would have been a lot of raw emotion. And I know I know Kevin McStay has been quizzed on this uh, in the past, and uh, um, even on our own podcast and in the Mayo News. Um, and he's always been ambivalent about it. He's never you know ruled it out or ruled it in. Um, so it, it was the news started to emerge on the Thursday morning. That's the twenty eighth of July. Just the, the deadline was six pm the following day news started to emerge that his, his name was in the hat, it did catch a lot of people by surprise because whilst he had been mentioned in a general sense in the same way that Jim McGuinness or Jim Gavin or 
um, Maliki O'Rourke were mentioned. Um, he wasn't in the, the list of people at local level that pe um, people were saying were going to go forward. That seemed to be limited uh, up until that week to Ray Dempsey, Mike Zolan and Stephen Rochford. And then Declan Shaw from Castlebar Mitchells came forward as well. Um, his candidacy was 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 confirmed uh, two day, uh, three days previously, so it did catch a lot of it did catch a lot of people by surprise. Um, but I, I'm just thinking back to 2014 and when that happened, and there would have been a sense then among some people in Mayo that Mayo's Mayo's chance had uh, to win an All Ireland had come and went, um, and yet they ended up being in all Ireland finals in 16 and 17 and 20 and 20, 21, and still haven't got over the line. Um, but maybe you know, maybe there's a sense, and if you see if you see that backroom team that has come together, and you look at the other backroom team, um, there's a sense that um, you know they they obviously feel that there is an All Ireland there, and we were having this discussion with Tony Lean from the Examiner on uh, on our own podcast recently, and he was saying that he was surprised by the quality of people that had come forward, and I just think a, a factor for that is that it's probably a lot more wide open of an All-Ireland Championship now than it might have been in 16, 17, etc. when Dublin were so strong. I would argue Mayo themselves were stronger then than they are now, but the field has come back a little bit. And there's, you know, you saw Galway obviously making massive inroads this year. Derry likewise, Tyrone um, coming from left field to win an All-Ireland last year. Um, so, you know, may, maybe that's uh, maybe that sense is out there that um, you know it's 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 going to be a very competitive All Ireland Championship, and uh, that obviously these um, these four candidates feel that there still is an All Ireland uh, potential in this in this Mayo squad. Like Rochford's name as part of the backroom team is perhaps the most interesting of all because, as I say, like he took Mayo to the absolute brink in 16 and 17 against arguably the greatest football team we've ever seen and pushed them to within an inch of their life. He's since gone on and taken that secondary role with Donegal, uh, you know, without a huge amount of success there. But from the outside, would have felt that Rochford, if he had gone in as number one, that you know he would have had a, a huge chance. Is is that just personal circumstances that he doesn't want that responsibility, that weight of responsibility? That he's a bit happier now in the shadows. Well, I I, I I'm not entirely sure. It's it, like certainly by it was. A matter of weeks after uh, he he finished with Mayo in 2018, that he 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 pitched up in Donegal, and uh, I think a lot of people at the time were surprised that he was willing to go in as number two, having come so close to winning an All Ireland as a manager, and to go in at, at number two with Donegal under Declan Bonner. But it did, I suppose, show um, you know a, a lack of ego, uh, perhaps, and, and and also maybe maybe after those three years, he felt you know. Is, is there uh, is is there more uh, is there more to be got out of it personally, concentrating on the coaching side of things rather than the rigmarole that comes with being an intercounty manager in terms of everything the book stops with you everything that happens has to go through you um, and like it's it's become OTB AM with Gillette get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar OTB. Sports Radio. We've got a panel who know a thing or two about being trailblazers.